Good afternoon, please be seated. Routine proceedings, introduction of bills. Ah, before we uh, get into introduction of bills, I have a statement. I'm advising the House that I've received a letter from the government House Leader and the member for Tyndall Park indicating that the member for Tyndall Park has identified Bill 209, the Provincial Court Amendment Act, expanded training for judges and judicial just justices of the peace as their selected bill for this season. As a reminder to the House, Rule Bill Rule 25 permits each independent member to select one private member's bill per session to proceed to a second reading vote and it requires the government house leader and the member to provide written notice as to the date and time of the debate and the vote. I have therefore been advised that Bill 209 will be debated at second reading on Tuesday, April 16, 2024, starting at 10 a.m., with the question to be put at 10.55 a.m. Note that in accordance with Rule 24-7, any recorded vote requested would be deferred to Thursday, April 18th, 2024, at 11.55 a.m. Routine proceedings, introduction of bills. The Honorable Member for St. Boniface. Honorable Speaker, I move, seconded by the MLA for Seine River, that Bill 300, the Winnipeg Foundation's Amended Act, loi modifiant la loi sur la fondation dénommée, the Winnipeg Foundation, be now read a first time. been moved by the Honourable Member for St. Boniface, seconded by the Honourable Member for St. River, that Bill No. 300, the Winnipeg Foundation Amendment Act, be now read a first time. The Honourable Member for St. Boniface. Honourable Speaker, I am pleased to introduce Bill 300, the Winnipeg Foundation's Amendment Act, this bill contains amendments to this act that will support the Winnipeg Foundation Board in updating their act to support changes in their methods of governance. I am honored to sponsor this amendment to support the Winnipeg Foundation's mission in being a catalyst for strengthening community well-being by promoting philanthropy, creating partnerships, and supporting diverse charitable organizations. I am pleased to present this bill to the House for its consideration. Is it the pleasure of the House to adopt the motion? Agreed and so ordered. Any further bills? Committee reports? Tabling of reports? Ministerial statements? The Honourable Minister of Health, Seniors and Long-Term Care. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. I rise today to mark the Canadian Cancer Society's Daffodil Campaign. I would like to introduce Andrea Seal, who is with us today in the gallery, the Chief Executive Officer of Canadian Cancer Society, and an incredible team of staff and volunteers who are joining her in the gallery today. Thank you all so much for being here. I want to thank these folks from the bottom of my heart for the important work that they do and for joining us today. The Daffodil Campaign takes place this spring as it has for more than 65 years. Since the late 1940s, the Canadian Cancer Society has shown its commitment to the cause, to cancer cause, by funding research and supporting those affected by the disease. They offer a support system that helps Canadians live their lives as fully as possible by helping them manage life with cancer. They provide community and connection and build wellness and resilience throughout the cancer journey. Honourable Speaker, most people, almost everyone, is touched by this disease. We all know someone who has or has had cancer. An estimated two in five Canadians will be diagnosed at some point in their lifetime. Now the good news is that progress is being made. Thanks to investments in prevention, early detection and in treatment, the overall cancer survival rates have increased from about 25% in the 1940s to 60% today. I ask all of us to take a moment today 
to remember and reflect on the people who have passed, who are living with cancer, and the loved ones who support them in their journey. To all of you on this difficult journey, know that you are not alone. Our goal as a government is to have more Manitobans hear those important words. You are cancer free. As one of many steps, our government is committed to a new cancer care facility so cancer patients and their families can get the best care on their cancer journey. Our government is committed to supporting the research and expertise being developed here in Manitoba, Manitoba and supporting innovation across the province. I'd like to recognize the President and CEO of Cancer Care Manitoba, Dr. Sareen Navaratnam, who is also here today, as well as members of her team. And as well, I want to recognize the work that Cancer Care Manitoba Foundation does in realizing this important milestone. As part of the budget that we introduced last week, Budget 2024, we are also making important investments in new cutting-edge cancer drugs through the Provincial Oncology Drug Program, companion testing to better match patients with appropriate cancer drugs, and new, a new cancer care headquarters. So in closing, Honourable Speaker, I want to thank the Canadian Cancer Society, all of your amazing volunteers for everything that you do to support families and communities who are touched by cancer. I encourage all members of this House and Manitobans everywhere to show their support for those affected by cancer by supporting the Daffodil Campaign. And I'd ask all members of this House to join me in standing up and thanking these folks for everything that they do. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Roblin. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. The month of April is Daffodil Month, where all Manitobans can show their support for cancer research and for loved ones fighting cancer by wearing a daffodil pin and supporting the important work of the Canadian Cancer Society. Uh, just earlier today, many of us in the chamber had the opportunity to attend a lunch and learn downstairs hosted by the Canadian Cancer Society. And I just want to extend my sincere thank you to Andrea Seal, uh, to Susan Russell Cezanne from the Canadian Cancer Society uh, for joining us here at the legislature today, uh, as well as many of the other stakeholders that joined us as well, including Palliative Manitoba, uh, Mantra, the Manitoba Lung Association, the Heart and Stroke Foundation, Pharmacists Manitoba, and Cancer Care Manitoba. I'd particularly like to thank Sony a nurse and a cancer survivor who shared an important story with us over lunch. Sony practices at Mount Carmel Clinic, and she serves patients for whom the social determinants of health are a very real consideration. Uh, she shared how while every cancer journey is unique, uh, a cancer diagnosis can be particularly difficult for those experiencing poverty and other challenges. It was a very moving uh, story, and I just want to thank Sony again for sharing that with us today. I'd also like to express my sincerest gratitude to all of the healthcare workers in our province who provide excellent care to Manitoba patients. I'd like to acknowledge caregivers whose lives are also impacted by cancer and volunteers with organizations like Palliative Manitoba who are also a critical part of many people's cancer journeys. I'd like to thank cancer researchers and all of those who support cancer research in one way or another. Your contributions to the fight against cancer are incredibly important and inspire hope to all those who have cancer or know someone who's fighting it. Uh, I'd like to echo the comforting words of the Princess of Wales, who, upon disclosing her recent cancer diagnosis, said, for everyone facing this disease, in whatever form, please do not lose faith or hope. You are not alone. Honourable Speaker, I'd ask for leave for a, a moment of silence for those who've lost their lives to cancer and to those who are currently fighting. Thank you. Is there leave for a moment of silence at the end of the member for Tyndall Park's comments? Agreed. The honorable member for Tyndall Park. I thank you, honorable speaker, and I ask for leave to respond to the minister's statement. Does the member have leave? Agreed. The member for Tyndall Park. Thank you, honorable speaker. 
the Canadian Cancer, cancer Society has been committed to uniting and inspiring Canadians to take control of cancer since 1938. Through their efforts, significant progress has been made in reducing cancer incidence and mortality. Because of the Canadian Cancer Society, we know more than ever before about what causes cancer, how it develops, and how to best prevent and treat it. Yet despite the progress, the number of new cancer cases continues to increase as a result of the growing and aging population. In Manitoba, the projected increase in all cancers going forward to 2025 is as high as 9.7%. It was estimated that an average of 655 people in Canada would be diagnosed with cancer and 238 people would die from cancer each day in 2023. The most common cancers are prostate cancer, which accounts for 20% of all new cancer cases in males, breast cancer, which accounts for 25% of all new cancer cases in females. Lung cancer is the second most common cancer, and with the significant sources of radon in Manitoba, this is a growing concern for everyone. Honourable Speaker, cancer poses an enormous burden on both the health of Canadians and the healthcare system. Promoting cancer prevention and providing targeted support to help people with cancer and their families and caregivers is all part of the important work that the Canadian Cancer Society does and why donations are so important. These, they use these funds raised to accelerate innovations, to bring the most promising solutions forward in career in cancer prevention, diagnosis, treatment and survivorship. Educating people on how to reduce their risk of cancer and how some types of cancer can be found early is critical to preventing tragedy, improving lives, and changing the future of cancer forever. Thank you to the Canadian Cancer Society for all the work that you have done and continue to do to unite and inspire all Canadians to take control of cancer. Thank you. All members rise for a moment of silence. Before we move on to member statements, I would like to draw the attention of all honourable members to the public gallery where we have with us today from the Canadian Cancer Society, Canadian Cancer Society staff, Susan Russell, Angeline Webb, Matt Picard, Bonnie Lee Lambert, Kelly Zorich, Andrea Sale from the Canadian Cancer Society volunteers, Carol Vivier, Adoration, Flores Rose Sony, Victoria Lehman, Deborah Rodewald, Mark Olfert, Christine Smith, Karen Dobbin, Sandra Perot, Anita Leblo, Rihanna Angel Lynn Frost, Alan Pamalona, Amanda Schmidt, and Cancer Care Manitoba, Dr. Nava. Turan Nam, President and CEO, Dr. Arbin Duby, Chief Medical Officer, and Ken Borse, Chief Clinical, Chief of Clinical Operations. Uh, they're all here as guests of the Honourable Member for Union Station, and on behalf of all members, we welcome you here today. <laughs> Member statements. The Honourable Minister of Labour and Immigration. <clears throat> I rise to speak on the exceptional work of the Kuwaitin Inkster Neighbourhood Resource Council for Seniors. Located on Logan Avenue, the Kinarsi's mission is to support independent living for older adults through programming and services. The KINRC supports Weston, Brooklands, Tyndall Park, Shaughnessy, Garden Grove and Meadows West. The Resource Council connects seniors to community aid and agencies through their information and referral programs. And for those who may need additional supports to live comfortably at home, home care aids and handy transit service referrals are made available. 
When older adults no longer have the capacity to maintain their homes, KinRC offers home maintenance referrals. During tax season, the KinRC hosts a no-cost community volunteer income tax program for older adults with modest incomes. And for those who seek legal aid, last will and testament and power of attorney documents are provided at lower rates through the council's legal clinic. Volunteers prepare nutritious meals at low cost to their members through the men and women in the kitchen congregate meal program. And in their commitment to safety and well-being, KinRC hosts a call-in program and their Technology 101 program provides older adults a space to learn their devices. The KinRC has proven to be always willing to assist older adults regardless of their unique needs. Following the flood at Westland's nonprofit housing cooperative, <clears throat> KinRC provided tenants with supports like emergency hotel arrangements, temporary housing assistance, and swift insurance claim submissions. Through their services and support, many residents of Westlands were temporarily rehoused. I would like to thank Harvey Sumka, the Senior Resource Coordinator, whose passion for community and supporting older adults is undeniable. The member's time has expired. Is there, leave has been granted. The Honourable Minister of Labour. Thank you. And another resounding thank you to the staff, board of directors, and extraordinary KinRC volunteers, many of which join us in the gallery today. You are truly the embodiment of community leadership and a testament to what communities can accomplish when we ensure that nobody is left behind. Thank you so much for all your efforts and for coming in today. I would like to add the names of my guests to Hansard and a special shout out to my favorite conservative, Gord Farley. <laughs> <laughs> The Honourable Member for Portage La Prairie. Honourable Speaker, today I'm honoured to talk about a very special organization in my constituency of Portage La Prairie that has truly made a difference in the lives of young people. Big Brothers Big Sisters of Central Plains is celebrating its 50th anniversary this year, which is an incredible milestone. Big Brothers Big Sisters creates mentoring relationships between adults and youth who are facing adversities in their lives and helps them live up to their full potential. This benefits not only the youth mentees, but the entire community. Youth who have a strong role model in their lives have higher self-esteem and a sense of belonging. Many young people find themselves in vulnerable situations in facing adversities such as mental health issues, family violence, or poor living conditions which, which put these youth at risk. With the guidance and support of a mentor, these risks can be avoided and these young people can gain the confidence to achieve more, higher incomes, happier lives, and contributions in their community. Organizations like the Big, Sister, Big Brothers and Big Sisters and the individuals who are devoted to them are really the glue that holds our communities together. I am so pleased that Executive Director of Big, Sister, Big Brothers Big Sisters Central Plains, Don Fraze, is here with us today. Don has been this role, in this role for an astounding 28 years and is a well-known leader in our community. Joining Dawn today is Laura, a mentoring coordinator, as well as Shay, who is a big sister and soon to be board member. Big brothers, big sisters of Central Plains Board of Directors are to be commended for their Member's leadership. Member's time has expired. Please. Leave has been granted. The Honorable Member for Portage La Prairie for their leadership and impact their efforts have had on the countless young people in Portage La Prairie and surrounding area. Please join me in a huge round of applause to celebrate Big Brothers, Big Sisters, Central Plains, half a century of mentorship.
The Honourable Member for the Boroughs. Honourable Speaker, Happy Khalsa Sajana Devas, Happy Vaisakhi, and Happy Turban Day in advance. The time is 13th April 1699, and on the special occasion of Vaisakhi, Guru Gobind Singh Ji, the 10th Sikh Guru, initiates the Khalsa Panth in Punjab, India. The Khalsa is a community of saintly soldiers tasked to uphold the principles of Sikhism, defending righteousness, serving humanity fearlessly, and believing in the fundamental equality of all human beings. Now the year is 2024, and we are celebrating Sikh Heritage Month to raise awareness about Sikhism and Turban. For over a century, Sikh Canadians have made invaluable contributions to Canada's multicultural fabric. From farming to serving in the Canadian Armed Forces, from entrepreneurship to public service, from fine arts to politics, from health sciences to education and research, a Sikh wearing a turban is visible in every single field. Manitoba Legislature is currently the only legislature in our country with two turban-wearing members proudly serving the people of Manitoba. In the early 20th century, turbaned Sikh immigrants who were often denied public services faced employment discrimination and hate crimes. Young Sikh children faced bullying, name-calling, and exclusion based on their appearance, which continues as I speak. We continue to stand together against this discrimination. Bill 227, the Turban Day Act, was unanimously passed in this chamber in 2022. I want to say thank you to my colleagues for the support. Now we have an event dedicated to encouraging dialogue and education about the turban. This year's event the is... The Honourable Member's time has expired. Leave has been granted. The Honourable Member for the Boroughs. Now we have an event dedicated to encouraging dialogue and education about the turban. This year's event is scheduled for tomorrow, Friday, April 12th, 1 p.m. onwards. This is an opportunity for us all to experience wearing a turban, learn about its significance, and promote mutual respect and acceptance. I invite everyone to attend. Miigwech and Sat Shri Akal, Honorable Speaker. The Honorable Member for Swan River. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. I rise today to recognize a special group of men and women in my constituency, the 4th Canadian Rangers Patrol Group. The Canadian Rangers are a subcomponent of the Canadian Army Reserve who live and work in remote, isolated, and coastal regions of Canada. They provide light-equipped, cell-sufficient mobile forces to support Canadian Armed Forces, national security, and public safety operations within Canada. Recently, Swan River, Manitoba was named the best patrol in the 4th Canadian Ranger Patrol Group for 2023 of the 47 patrols of the 4th Territory located in Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Alberta, and BC. This prestigious award, the Honorary Canadian Ranger, Morris Kachansky Cup has only become available in the last four years, with Swan River being the second to receive the honour. The recognition acknowledges participation in local community events, ground search rescue, running local patrols and exercises, working with other patrols across the 4th CRPG to expand skill sets and acting as representatives for the Canadian Rangers on various tasks, including international deployment to Australia to train within the Australian Army in the Northern Territory. There is a deep respect for the great men and women that are involved with the Rangers, and achieving this award shows competency, professionalism, and the ability to, to deploy quickly and efficiently in any conditions to meet the needs of the Canadian Armed Forces and their community. Honourable Speaker, whether assistance is required with ground search and rescue, support during natural disaster or emergencies, support to the Canadian Armed Forces, the Canadian Rangers are there to answer the call of duty whenever needed. Congratulations to all Canadian Ranger groups for their dedication and service to all of Canada. The Honourable Member for Riel. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. Today I'm pleased to recognize the exceptional achievements of Ethan Lyric. 
an accomplished young indigenous singer-songwriter from our Riel community. Having found a home in Manitoba's indie folk scene, Ethan has brought his guitar and his voice to venues across the province, including the Winnipeg Folk Festival. His most recent EP, Saskatoon Berries, has gripped the Indigiverse, an indigenous music channel on Sirius XM. The station has given Messing Things Up Again and other songs from the EP considerable airtime. He has also recently featured by Manitoba's music, Indigenous Music Development Program on their Talking Stick music video series. Ethan's music has been an avenue for self-exploration and has brought him closer to his Anishinaabe roots. He channels his culture into his art and learned basic Anishinaabe Moan to express himself more fully. Music has also presented an opportunity for the Indigenous community to reconnect with him as just last fall he joined the Firekeepers Indigenous Song Circle Tour alongside Don Amaro and the Calgary duo, duo Scarlett Butler. Having advocated for Indigenous language revitalization on the federal scene, Ethan is planning on attending the University of British Columbia to study linguistics and Indigenous languages alongside his music. He has already been recognized for numerous awards and scholarships, and it was even a finalist for the prestigious Loran Scholarship, which celebrates students from across the country who work to make the world a better place. Ethan hopes to continue using his musical abilities to create positive change and foster Indigenous knowledge, language, and ways of being in himself and those around him. Riel is fortunate to have youth like Ethan who dedicate themselves to their passions and use them to lift others up. Please join me in congratulating Ethan Lyric on his incredible career thus far and in wishing him well on the road ahead. Oral questions. The Honorable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. This new NDP government similarly promised not to raise taxes. Now, because of cuts they made to education, they think they can get away with raising property taxes on middle-class Manitobans. But worse, they think Manitobans will believe anything they have to say. Like when this Premier says he's not planning a Manitoba carbon tax. Manitobans don't believe him. The Prime Minister said it can't be free to pollute. The Premier isn't credible on this issue because of his many, 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 many flip-flops. Much like Greg Salinger, this NDP leader says one thing and will do another. Will he come clean like about his carbon peace. tax plan? Yes. The Honourable First Minister. Well, I encourage the uh, member opposite to mind his elocution because it sounded like he was saying I is incredible. That's but, right. But uh, we'll leave that to him to sort out <laughs> later on. Again, we know that Manitobans have been dealing with a rising cost of living for years yeah, that's right. under the progressive conservatives. Every single day that they were in office, yep. they charged Manitobans 14 cents a litre at the pump. At the same time, they left money on the table because they would rather pick fights with other levels of government instead yep. of bringing home the goods That's for right. the people of Manitoba. The good news is there's a new administration. Mm -hmm. It's a new day in Manitoba. Sure on January 1 of this year, we cut the provincial fuel tax so that you save money at the pump. At the same time, we're repairing the relationships with the federal government, with municipal governments, with indigenous governments. We know that the people that we serve are you, the people of Manitoba, and we're taking real steps to make your life more affordable each and every day. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition on a supplementary question. Honourable Speaker, the Premier continues to pat himself on the back for his temporary tax relief whilst raising permanent taxes on all Manitobans. That's why, and that's one way to lose credibility, Honourable Speaker. Breaking your promises is another way. Greg Selinger learned that the hard way. In politics and life, your words matter. Manitobans are quickly learning this Premier's flip-flop tactics. He has the opportunity here in the House to change that today. The Prime Minister's challenge to provinces is essentially to replace his carbon tax with another. No so-called net zero plan or talk from this Premier can change that. Why is the NDP leader not sharing his carbon tax plan with Manitobans? 
The Honorable First Minister. I think it's really important to encourage the next generation of Manitobans to pursue their dreams. That's right. I also think it's really important to encourage the next generation of Manitobans to stand up for their principles and to stand up for what they believe in. Mm -hmm. I do have to contrast that, of course, with what the member opposite is recommending. He says, as soon as somebody else says something, you're supposed to just meekly turn away and go along with whatever they direct you to do. Uh, whether it's Mr. Trudeau, whether it was the edicts of the Stephenson government, they don't seem to show the courage to stand up for their convictions. But they should ask themselves, what did that do to the credibility of the Stephenson government? Government. Right. They want to criticize the federal government. We've been clear. We don't need a federal backstop. But was, whereas they charged a, ca a gas tax of 14 cents a litre every single day they were in office, what did we do on January 1 of this year? We brought it to zero. That saves you and your family money each and every day. That's right. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition on a final supplementary question. Thank you, uh, Honourable Speaker, and we'll see if for the third time's the charm, if the Premier has the courage to answer this question. The Premier claims he has a very credible path to net zero. The Prime Minister has made it clear he sees no path to net zero that does not include a carbon tax. It can't be free to pollute anywhere in the country, the Prime Minister said. So what is on this credible path? Agriculture? Industrial use? Manufacturing? Municipalities? Transportation? We're asking about the carbon tax because no matter how you slice it or what he might want to call it, there's going to be a cost to Manitobans because of this government's agenda. I'm asking on behalf of all Manitobans, what will that cost be under this NDP? The Honourable First Minister. Member opposite should read the budget. That's right. The cost on Manitobans is zero. That's right. Zero cents a litre because of the steps that we've taken on this side of the House under the leadership of our finance minister. I'd add that the, minister, the member opposite doesn't have credibility on this. No. He criticizes the carbon tax, and yet he has voted twice That's right. in favor of the PC carbon tax That's here right. in Manitoba. Oh. We were the ones to block them from bringing that in. And again, he wants to criticize a measure that is putting money back in the pockets of the working class of the blue collar, That's of right. the middle class. Well, he can go ahead and try and square those circles. We're going to keep coming to work each and every day to save you money and make life better in this great province. The Honourable Member for Brandon West. I want to pick up where we left off that yesterday, Honourable Speaker. The member for Brandon East was in the process of making up really good news stories and avoiding the facts. He said that Brandon got the highest school funding increase in the province, but that unfortunately just is not oh, true. Oh, I tabled this government's own document that showed that Lie. River East Transcona, wow. Division Eau Claire Manito uh, Franco Manitoba, uh, and the Winnipeg School Division got higher increases, as well as Kelsey School Division wow. got Whoa. a larger increase by Doesn't percentage. Stand up for or, Why did this Brandon minister Heights. misspeak and mislead Manitobans? Yeah. 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 The Honourable First Minister. Honourable First Minister. Always happy to stand up for the people of Brandon, That's right. who were ignored far too often during the two terms of the failed PC administration. We were really happy that our first pre-budget announcement was at the hospital in Brandon, where we committed to a new minor injury and illness clinic. That's going to improve health care for people in the city of Brandon, but also across the entire Westman region. Now, when we talk about education funding, I want to read to you a quote here. Uh, about the Brandon School Division. It oh, yeah. says, this is from the Brandon Sun, keep in mind, in its latest budget, the Brandon School Division was forced to contend with a $1.2 million budget deficit, oh. which prompted trustees to cut programs and staffing oh. positions. And thus far, the province has not yet shown evidence of any new plan to properly fund education, end quote. Do you know when that was from? That was from April 2022, when they were in power. Oh! 
The Honorable Member for Brandon West on a supplementary question. Look at that, Honorable Speaker. It's amazing that this government loves to talk about Brandon increases. It's just unfortunate that they can't bring themselves to actually follow through on their words. Yeah, All of the promises for Brandon have come from our government. That's right. That's right. So I asked. I asked this minister yesterday about the false information that was reported to the Brandon Sun, and all this minister could do was talk about himself. So, did this minister advocate for ACC uh, nope. and Brandon University nope. and our institutions nope. facing enrollment cuts nope. because he didn't try, or is it because his government is ineffective? Yeah. The Honorable First Minister. Did this member did this member speak up when the Stephenson government was putting up ads attacking the family of murder victims? Did he say that that was a good idea or did he just go along with the plan? Did this member speak up when the Stephenson government was putting up ads attacking trans children? Or did he just go along with the plan? What we have on this side of the house with the member for Brandon East and a whole team of community leaders are people who will stand up each and every day to do the right thing. That means we're investing in the community of Brandon with a new minor in injury and illness clinic because we know that the important part of returning the province to a good footing after years of the PC administration has to start with health care. Our plan for health care includes Brandon, and unlike the PCs, it includes all of Manitoba. Yay! The Honourable Member for Brandon West on a final supplementary question. Sensitive. Honourable Speaker, I'm left to ask, did this minister speak up when that false information got to the Brandon Sun? No. 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 University no. of Winnipeg no. clearly has a vocal advocate at the Cabinet table. Not only were they spared from international student cuts, they were actually given more to grow. Wow. I'm sure that Brandon University and the Assiniboine Community College would have loved for that consideration. This have. minister said Brandon is at the forefront. I guess what is meant is that our community is taking it on the chin to shelter Winnipeg. Brandon is getting $200,000 of the $52 million this government oh. has introduced. Oh. Our fair share by population is just shy of $2 million. So I asked the member for Brandon East, can our member Member's time has expired. Order, please. Order, please. Just a reminder to the member that when the speaker stands up and says your time has expired, it's time to sit down. The Honourable First Minister. No. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. We know that our government is serious about making investments in the Westman region and in Brandon. That's why we're committed to a new minor injury and illness clinic, as well as staffing up the health care system. That's why the Westman is going to start to see doctor training right. come to the region as part of the commitment to 100 new doctors that the Minister of Health shared today. Under the PCs, there were strikes at Brandon University, there were potholes on 18th Street, and the cuts to operating funding led to cuts with law enforcement. I will read a statement from the Brandon and Sun, March 11, 2023 that illustrates the impact of PC cuts to municipal funding. The police chief at the time said, and I quote, it's never great for me to come forward and say that we have a budget deficit, end quote. Do you know who that was? It was the member for Brandon West. Oh! Oh! <laughs> Order. The Honourable Member for Roblin. I can hardly wait till I start using Order. Your Yesterday we revealed that over 1,300 surgeries were cancelled in just the first three months of this NDP government. Mm -hmm. yeah. And now after months of waiting once again, the NDP have finally updated surgical diagnostic wait times data online. Oh, there you go. So what's happened since the NDP took office and cut short-term surgical capacity? Wait times are up. Since October, wait times for knee replacements are up eight weeks. Cardiac wait times are up 45%. And MRI and cataract wait times are up significantly across the board in Winnipeg. How much longer do the NDP expect patients in pain to continue waiting for care? 
The Honorable Minister of Health, Seniors and Long-Term Care. Honourable Speaker, our government has reduced the number of postponed or cancelled surgeries yeah. from what it was under the previous PC government. Right. The previous government sent millions of dollars out of province. They yeah. sent patients out of province. San Francisco, North Dakota, Toronto, Cleveland. They did nothing actually to reduce wait times. On this side of the House, we're investing in improving capacity. We're repairing the relationships with the very doctors we depend on for that capacity. And we're going to continue to make health care better for all Manitobans. Great job. The Honourable Member for Roblin on a supplementary question. What the Minister of Health actually did is let dozens of agreements signed by the task force with, with uh, clinics to increase surgical and diagnostic capacity lapse. Yeah. Yesterday, they refused to be transparent with the number of surgeries cancelled so far this year. Now, today, the data is showing that surgical wait times are trending up, mm. thanks to this NDP government. This is the direct result of the NDP putting politics over patients. Yeah. As usual. Why has this Minister of Health failed to put forward any immediate measures to help Manitobans who are waiting in pain today? Just like the written card. The Honourable Minister of Health, Seniors and Long-Term Care. Honourable Speaker, our government from day one did what the previous government refused to do. We started repairing the relationship with frontline health care workers. We started investing in improving capacity here in our own province. We've taken steps to address what they didn't do. They didn't actually do anything to address wait times. We are trending in a better direction under this government. Fewer surgeries have been cancelled this time this year than they were under the previous government this time last year. So, Honourable Speaker, we're going to continue to invest in capacity here in Manitoba and repairing the relationships that they tried to break for seven and a half years. Wow. Great job. Great. The Honourable Member for Roblin on a final supplementary question. Let's review the facts. Upon taking office, the first thing this NDP government did was cut the task force. Yeah. They took away the ability for Manitobans to get care out of province when the wait times here were too long. Then they waited till after the 11th hour to maybe, care. possibly, extend agreements made with private and public clinics to boost surgical and diagnostic capacity. Yeah. Nobody knows for sure. Now they've put forward a budget with no plan no to plan. address surgical wait times in the short term. And they're refusing to be transparent about cancellations. As a result, wait times are trending up. up. So it's their third answer, so I hope the minister tries answering the question and doesn't resort to unhinged personal attacks today. Oh, yeah, like Why has the minister offered nothing more than yeah. vague funny, promises eh? of help somewhere down funny. the road to Manitoba who are waiting has expired. The Honourable Minister of Health, Seniors and Long-Term Care. Honourable Speaker, uh, some might argue that it's unhinged to think that sending millions upon millions of dollars out of the province instead of investing in improving right. capacity here at home. Absolutely. Honourable Speaker, on this side of the House, we are going to continue to make sure that Manitobans have improved health care in their own province. Beyond the $50 million investment we've made to improve surgical capacity, we're investing in diagnostics, we're investing in retention and recruitment, we're investing in strength relationships. We're investing across the health care system with a province-wide approach. Honourable Speaker, you don't have to trust me or take my word for it. You could talk to Dr. Bouchel, who's leading surgical capacity development with our government in this province. You could talk to the frontline health care workers. Expired. Hey! The Honourable Member for Lakeside. Honourable Speaker, I spent yesterday and part of this morning meeting, listening and learning from municipalities at the AMM conference in Brandon. When I heard the Minister of Municipal Relations speak, I heard a different message about municipalities and members in this House heard from the Premier at the same time. We heard nothing about the funding the Premier spoke of. So I asked the Minister, did he forget to mention it or is that just another one of the things the Premier says in the heat of the moment when he makes government policy up in question period? The Honourable Minister of Municipal and Northern Relations. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. I'd like to welcome the critic to his new role in the portfolio. He has not spoken up for municipalities at all across that way, not once. 
and I was privileged to be out the meeting with AMM and hearing, and I'm sure the conversation that the member had at AMM was about the lifting of the freeze and what that meant for them and what that meant as a positive way going forward. And I'm sure the member fails to mention the impact that the seven years of freeze had on municipalities. I'm sure you heard that conversation because I heard it time and time again throughout my time at AMM. The Honourable Member for Lakeside on a supplementary question. Honourable Speaker, this commitment was not in the budget, nor was it mentioned by the Minister when speaking to AMM. In fact, AMM bemoaned the lack of the multi-year funding in this budget. This means that even if the Minister simply forgot to mention it, that his government is introducing it without even consulting with municipal leaders. This is quite a bad form, Honourable Speaker, especially since many remember the days of the last NDP government forcing amalgamations yep. and calling them howling coyotes. Yep. I ask the Minister, why does his government insist on carrying on Greg Salinger's disastrous policy of dictating to municipalities and not consulting with them? The Honourable Minister of Municipal and Northern Relations. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. I know the conversation that the member must have had out at AMM was about seven years of freezes and what that meant for municipalities and how much they suffered, how much they hurt, and how much they've stepped backwards from that. So when we talk about that, did he mention the fact that when he was out at AMM, did he mention the fact that he voted against a 2% increase for municipalities, he voted against investments in municipalities, and he wants to go back to the freezing of the former PC government? The Honourable Member for Lakeside on a final supplementary question. Honourable Speaker, instead of real policy, this Premier is making things up on the fly, and Manitobans are paying the price. Just look at this Minister who eliminated the greatly appreciated Building Sustainable Communities funding, robbing municipalities and Manitobans of hundreds of millions in project funding. Instead of real tangible action, they get smoke and mirrors. Municipalities like Brandon have 8.6 million reasons not to trust any promise from this government. The Premier avoided the question and his colleague for Brandon East, Brandon East was more interested in talking about himself than his constituents. So I ask this Minister of Municipal Relations, will he restore any of the $8.6 million that his government pledged and then clawed back from the City of Brandon? The Honourable Minister of Municipal and Northern Relations. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. The only mirror they're talking about is the mirror that they broke in those seven years of bad luck for Manitobans. <laughs> increasing, increasing municipal funding by 2%. Increasing operating funding to Miss Valley by over $58 million. $52 million to increase operating grants. $7 million increase to all capital grants. Four, four millions of invested in strategic missile funds permanently, not a one off like members opposite. What they failed to do in seven years, we've done more in less than seven months. Order. Order. The Honourable Member for Midland. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. This morning, we discussed a very serious issue of children and youth in care. I want to thank my colleague, the member from Morden Winkler, for sharing her personal and powerful experiences. As my colleague was pouring her heart out, this Minister of Families shamefully turned her back and walked away. Will this Minister of Families stand up and apologize to my colleague from Morton Winkler for the blatant disrespect that she showed her this morning? The Honourable Minister of Families. Miigwech, Honourable Speaker. Uh, unfortunately, and some of your colleagues or the members opposite colleagues can attest and affirm, we had LAMC at 11.30 a.m. and so I had to attend that to deal with the legislative affairs to make sure that things keep running here. So no, I won't apologize. The Honourable Member for Midland on a supplementary question. You were there for a while, Order. Dohani. 
It's unfortunate that this Minister of Families refuses to apologize for the blatant disrespect that she showed the member from Morden Winkler. Protecting children is the responsibility of all of us members in the Manitoba Legislature. And I do want to thank the Minister for Housing, Homelessness and Addictions for the kind and respectful words that she put on the record this morning. We on this side of the House know that we can work together for vulnerable children and youth in care. We believe a public inquiry is the best, most transparent and accountable way to do this. Will this Minister of Families commit to a public inquiry today and make the entire review public and transparent for Manitobans? You're here. The Honourable Minister of Families. Thank you, Mr. Honourable Speaker. As I shared this morning and as I have shared multiple times in this House, our priority is jurisdiction. Our priority is to reinstate the care and concern of children to the communities that they belong, to the families that they belong to, and in the nations that they belong to. As I've shared previously, we've never had the federal legislative framework in which to pursue jurisdiction and decolonize child welfare. Us on this side of the House have the courage to decolonize child welfare and to reinstate the care of children where it rightfully belongs with our people in our communities. The Honourable Member for Midland on a final supplementary question. Honourable Speaker, there are children and youth in care right now, and they desperately need the support and the resources from this NDP government. A child's call for help went unanswered, and two months later, she tragically passed away within my constituency. This is unacceptable, and a review should have immediately been called by this NDP government. Maya's mother has been demanding public accountability, the community of Carmen has demanding public accountability, and Manitobans are demanding accountability from this NDP government. Why is the Minister of Families refusing to be accountable to Manitobans? The Honourable Minister of Families. Miigwech, Honourable Speaker. Again, as I stated this morning, and as I've stated repeatedly in this House and in media, one of the first things I did was call an immediate review of what happened, the tragic situation that happened in Carmen. I shared with the member this morning in her resolution that that's exactly what I did. We've ordered a departmental review. There's a, a, a police investigation going on right now. And I also shared in the House previously that we're hoping to have the departmental review by the end of the month. So, Honourable Speaker, I seem, it seems that I have to continue to correct the, the record this afternoon with all of the erroneous facts that the member opposite puts on the record. The Honourable Member for Portage La Prairie. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. When speaking to the Humane Society of Winnipeg, the member for St. John stated that the NDP would not reinstate a hog moratorium. To be clear, Honourable Speaker, this is one issue that the member and I agree upon. Unfortunately, given the NDP's history of flip-flop, I'd like to confirm that their position still stands. Can the Minister of Agriculture confirm to us today that they stand by the statement that the NDP will not reinstate the hog barn moratorium? Thank you. The Honourable Minister of Agriculture. Thank you so much, Honourable Speaker. And let me first and foremost, that I don't really get a chance too often to get up and respond to questions from members opposite. The most important thing today is there agriculture producers in the province of Manitoba that are our fruit basket to, to service the people of the importance of production? I want to ensure that producers, in fact, tonight, I'm very honoured to attend the pork, the 50 and 9th pork convention, and I was invited to attend the and be glad to speak on behalf of the importance of the pork industry in the province of Manitoba. And I'm sure that there will be some members opposite. But I want to know that this government does believe in added value of the pork industry in our province of Manitoba and will continue to work with the industry for the betterment of the population in Manitoba. The Honourable Member for Port Oshawa Prairie on a supplementary question. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. 
I am excited to work in the breadbasket of Manitoba here. Just a quick reminder, the NDP hog barn ban was at first a temporary moratorium as the NDP blamed Order. our farmers and turned them into scapegoats. Rather than trusting science, they trusted their gut and Manitobans paid the price. Will the Minister of Environment and Climate Change commit to never instituting environmental regulations that become a de facto hog barn moratorium? The Honourable Minister of Agriculture. Thank you so much, Honourable Speaker. Well, let's, let's confirm there is no moratorium on hard barn, hog barn productions in the province of Manitoba. And I think Member Opson is quite aware of it. But I think, and more importantly, if I may share this, and I've got some documentation I'd like to share with the, the Agriculture Group Praises Provincial Budget. It's a lot of good thing announcements for agriculture. Let's put the good place moving forward with the current government. Producers were concerned about the number of mask offices closures that happened in the past. Oh. Dale Werway from the Keystone Agriculture Producers is very happy, and I'm glad to share this documentation for the great stuff this side of the House. Member's has time has expired. And we will. Member's time has expired. The Honourable Member for Portage La Prairie. Thank you so much, Honourable Speaker. This evening, I will, I will have the good fortune to dine with several hundred of the 22,000 Manitobans employed by the hog sector. These farmers and this entire industry remember life under this NDP government, where they were portrayed as villains and denied the opportunity to build our province and our economy. Keeping in mind that I'm not asking about Ag Crown lands, will this Minister of Agriculture ever reinstate the hog barn moratorium? Yes or no? The Honourable Minister of Agriculture. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. May I? Oh, yeah. May I uh, now that you mentioned Crown land. Honourable Speaker, obviously the members opposite are even concerned, but they keep bringing it up every time I stand up. They're conscientiously being somewhat guilty of the choices they made going back a number of years ago. And I want to assure members opposite, it's going to be a challenge for the young producers, and they will never be forgotten. The government next door will never be forgotten the choices they made besides closing 15 mask offices. All the time has like expired. The member's time has expired. <laughs> the Honourable Member for Tyndall Park. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. Prior to the budget, the Manitoba Child Care Association made a pre-budget submission asking for this government to create a comprehensive workforce strategy for early childhood educators. A strategy was promised by this government in their election platform, but it's nowhere to appear in their budget. Can the minister share with us why they promised a comprehensive workforce strategy in the election, but for whatever reason did not include it in their budget? The Honourable Minister of Education and Early Childhood Learning. Well, thank you, Honourable Speaker, and I want to thank the member for Tyndall Park for bringing up that important issue. As you know, in the budget that was just recently released, we do have a strategy clearly outlined that, <clears throat> that deals with wages. Wages are going to be the number one issue that will keep the sector going, and we're going to ensure that not only are we going to have the training places in place, but we're also going to have wages that will keep the child care workers working with our youngest learners in their location. Nice. Yeah. The Honourable Member for Tyndall Park on a supplementary question. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. The funds towards increasing wages do not support a provincially funded salary scale nor a workforce strategy. Since the budget made no mention of recruitment and retention of ECEs, 
They, along with childcare experts, have expressed the concern of stable and predictable funding and the lack of a provincially funded salary scale. Can the Minister share with the House when ECEs can expect a framework for wages and benefits to be released? The Minister of Education and Early Childhood Learning. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. And again, I want to thank the member for that important question. It's an important one because one of the very first things that I did as Minister of Education and Early Childhood Learning was go out to Brandon. And once in Brandon, I met with the early child care providers in that sector, the Ys especially, where they're showing leadership not only around training and retention, but also wages. This is going to be critically important as we move forward. And I do share the concern with the member from Tilden Park. We do need to make sure that we have not only adequately trained professionals, but also professionals that are going to be kept in the sector. The Honourable Member for Tyndall Park. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. When the federal government partnered with the province, the original promise in 2021 was 23,000 childcare spaces. The Manitoba Child Care Coalition came to the legislature last November and explained that it took over two years for the government to implement 1,500 childcare spaces. How many childcare spaces has this government created since November 2023? The Honourable Minister of Education and Early Childhood Learning. Again, uh, I want to thank the member for that question because it does allow us to give an update to the House of the path that we're heading down right now. Right now, we've created up to 8,500 spaces and towards the end of fiscal year, we will have 13,500 spaces created right here in Manitoba for hardworking families. Again, the member brings up a very good point because not only is childcare important to the children, but it's also important to our economy because it releases people to get to work, go out and add more value to what we're creating here. And with this government, they're going to have a true partner in getting this done. And I look forward to the member for Tyndall Park to join us in supporting not only our budget, but what we want to do for childcare. Member's in time has expired. <laughs> the honorable member for Assiniboia. Honorable speaker, we are working to rebuild Manitobans' trust in our health care system. After years of cuts and firing and mass staff resignations among health care workers under the PCs, we can finally say it's a new day in Manitoba. Today I had the honour of joining the Premier and the Health Minister as they announced a plan to help with staff shortages in health care. Can the Minister tell the House about our government's plan to hire new doctors here in Manitoba? The Honourable Minister of Health, Seniors and Long-Term Care. Honourable Speaker, earlier today we announced our plan to add 100 new doctors to Manitoba this year. Our budget invests to make this happen. It will increase medical residency spots by 40 per cent. It restores the Rural Doctor Recruitment Fund, which the PCs cut. It adds new medical seats. It adds 30 new clinical assistant positions. It makes it easier for health care recruitment and retention to happen in Manitoba. It reduces administrative burden for doctors and much more. But importantly, it will do what the opposition never did in government. It respects physicians, attracts them to our province, and makes it easier for them to work in Manitoba. Well, they accuse doctors of, of creating chaos, we're giving them jobs. While they send patients out of province, Member's we're bringing doctors here. The Honourable Member for Morden Winkler. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. I'm hearing from constituents that the government delays are making it impossible to appropriately say goodbye to loved ones. It is reported that there is a several week delay for release of loved ones from the Office of the Chief Medical Examiner. And this minister is making it worse with budget cuts. Will the minister reverse this budget cut today and insist instead hire staff to, uh, that need for, to make uh, things more appropriately quickly for Manitobans? Yeah, yeah. Good job. The Honourable Minister of Housing, Addictions and Homelessness. 
Omigwich Honorable Speaker. And I want to thank uh, the medical examiner and all the staff for the amazing work that they're doing. I know that it's, you know, um, hard work, and I know that there's a lot of families that are, um, that are, that rely on the work that they're doing. And they're doing such amazing heavy lifting. And I can assure that member that there is no cuts to that office and that they are doing incredible work. And under that government, families were waiting far, far longer than any other, uh, than they're waiting now. So this government can, you know, get up, but I assure that member that there is no cuts and we are working with the medical examiner's office. Okay. The Honourable Member for Morden Winkler on a supplementary question. This is a nonpartisan. This is nonpartisan, Honourable Speaker. We are talking about basic dignity for families. This causes additional stress and grief as it limit as it limits the traditional practices can, that can be observed. Everyone deserves di this dignity, and families deserve closure. Why is this minister cutting staff when Manitobans are necess unnecessarily suffering? Yeah, yeah. The Honourable Minister of Housing, Addictions and Homelessness. Miigwech, Honourable Speaker. And again, I can assure that member that there has been no cuts to staff. We are working with the medical examiner's office. Families are having, um, we know that families are struggling and we know that um, when when the medical examiner is working with families, that they are taking the utmost sacred responsibility. And we know that, you know, as Indigenous people, that that is a sacred responsibility. We, we as say, uh, Indigenous people, like when we have ceremony with our, our loved ones, it's four days. So we sit with our, our loved ones and, like, it is such a sacred responsibility. And I know our medical examiner takes that responsibility so, so, uh, as much as we do Members as a time has people. expired. The Honourable Member for Morton Winkler on a final supplementary question. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. We have a responsibility in this chamber to serve Manitobans to the best of our abilities. We have the, respons we have the responsibility to do better. This minister cuts funding to the medical examiner when families are waiting weeks for remains to be released and are unable to say goodbye to their own, on their own terms. Why is this minister cutting staff when the system isn't working already? Yeah, yeah. The Honourable Minister of Housing, Addictions and Homelessness. Miigwech, Honourable Speaker. And I have already told that member that there have been no cuts to the medical examiner's office. There are some staffing challenges. I will tell the member that in terms of hiring people. But that was under that government. We know that the medical examiner takes that responsibility very sacredly. And when um, they are dealing with families and working with families, we are making sure that the information is getting to families, something that that government didn't do. I know that when they were in government, when families asked for information around overdose deaths, that they tried to hide those numbers. That's something that our government isn't doing. We are going to be transparent with those numbers and make sure that those numbers are members out. Members' time has expired. So the time for oral questions has ended, and I have a couple of things I'd like to bring forward. First off, I'd like to acknowledge Chief Maureen Brown from Opasquia Cree Nation, who's joining us in the gallery as the guest of the Honourable Member for the Paul Kamisak. Secondly, I'd like to make a small statement. There were several instances today throughout question period where we're starting to go down a path towards unparliamentary language. We didn't cross the line, but I want to remind members to let's not cross the line. Let's try and be respectful of each other. Let's keep it a little calmer. There was a couple of times when uh, things were said such as, where is it here, just one second. Uh, well, I can't find it now, so anyway. <laughs> no, uh, order please. The speaker is still standing. Order please. So I just caution members to try and pay attention to their words. We make our living in this place with words, so choose them carefully in the future. The 
orders of the day government no the honorable minister families on house business the honorable minister families on house business or government house leader uh honorable speaker uh can you please see if there is leave for the member of the boroughs uh, to provide Hansard with a list of names of his guests that are in the gallery and for those names to appear immediately following his member statements in the Hansard uh, transcript. Is there leave for uh, the member for the boroughs to provide Hansard with a list of names of his guests who are in the gallery and for these names to appear immediately following his member statement in the Hansard transcript. Agreed. Leave has been agreed. Petitions. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, uh, Honourable Speaker. I wish... <clears throat> I wish to uh, present the following petition to the Legislative Assembly. Thank you. The background to this petition is as follows. Number one. The federal government has mandated a consumption-based carbon tax with the stated goal of financially pressuring Canadians to make decisions to reduce their carbon emissions. Number two, Manitoba Hydro estimates that even with a high efficiency furnace, the carbon tax is costing the average family over $200 annually, even more for those with older furnaces. Number three, home heating in Manitoba is not a choice or a decision for Manitobans to make. It is a necessity of life with an average of almost 200 days below zero degrees Celsius annually. Number four, the government, the federal government has selectively removed the carbon tax off of home heating oil in the Atlantic provinces of Canada but has indicated they have no intention to provide the same relief to Manitobans heating their homes. Number five, Manitoba Hydro indicates that natural gas heating is one of the most affordable options available to Manitobans and it can be cost prohibitive if for households to replace their heating source. Number six, premiers across Canada, including in the Atlantic provinces that benefit from this decision, have collectively sent a letter to the federal government calling on it to extend the carbon tax exemption to all forms of heating, home heating, with the exception of Manitoba. Number seven, Manitoba is one of the only provincial jurisdictions to have not agreed with the stance that all Canadians' home heating bills should be exempt from the carbon tax. Number eight, provincial leadership in other jurisdictions have already committed to removing the federal carbon tax from home heating bills. We petition the Legislative Assembly of Manitoba as follows, to urge the provincial government to remove the federal carbon tax on home heating bills for all Manitobans to provide them much needed relief. This petition is signed by Cheryl Dawson, Dwayne Strecker, Arnie Pescatelli, and many other fine Manitobans. Any further petitions? The Honourable Member for Roblin. I wish to present the following petition to the Legislative Assembly. The background to this petition is as follows. In 2022, according to, to Statistics Canada, there was an 11.4% increase in food prices. Staple food products, such as baked goods, margarine and other oils, dairy products and eggs have seen some of the largest price increases. Agriculture and the agri-food sectors contribute close to 10% of Manitoba's GDP. There are increased costs added at every step of the process for Manitoba's agriculture producers. 
In order to make 18 cents from one loaf worth of wheat, farmers are paying carbon tax at every stage of production to grow the crop and get it to market. Grain drying, fertilizer and chemical production, mushroom farming, hog operations, the cost of heating a livestock barn, machine shops, and utility buildings are all examples of how the carbon tax on natural gas and other fuels cost farmers and consumers more each year. In food production, there are currently no viable alternatives to natural gas and propane. The carbon tax takes money away from farmers, making them less profitable, and hindering rural agricultural produce producers' ability to invest in upgrades and improve efficiency while reducing emissions. The provincial government neglected farmers in the six-month fuel tax holiday until the opposition critic and local stakeholder groups called for their inclusion. Other provincial jurisdictions and leaders have taken action on calling on the federal government to remove the punishing carbon tax and or stop collecting the carbon tax altogether. We petitioned the Legislative Assembly of Manitoba as follows. To urge the provincial government to call on the federal government to remove the punishing carbon tax on natural gas and other fuels and farm inputs for Manitoba agriculture producers and the agri-food sector to decrease the costs of putting food on the table for Manitoba consumers. And this petition is signed by many, many Manitobans. Other petitions? The Honourable Member for Riding Mountain. Honourable Speaker, I wish to present the following petition to the Legislative Assembly. The background to this petition is as follows. The federal government has mandated a consumption-based carbon tax with the stated goal of financially pressuring Canadians to make decisions to reduce their carbon emissions. Manitoba Hydro estimates that even with a high efficiency furnace, the carbon tax is costing the average family over $200 annually, even more for those with older furnaces. Seems low. Home heating in Manitoba is not a choice or a decision for Manitobans to make. It is a necessity of life, with an average of almost 200 days below zero degrees Celsius annually. The federal government has selectively removed the carbon tax off of home heating oil in the Atlantic provinces of Canada, but has indicated they have no intention to provide the same relief to Manitobans heating their homes. Manitoba Hydro indicates that natural gas heating is one of the most affordable options available to Manitobans, and it can be cost prohibited for households to replace their heating source. Premiers across Canada, including in the Atlantic provinces that benefit from this decision, have collectively sent a letter to the federal government calling on it to extend the carbon tax exemption to all forms of home heating with the exception of Manitoba. Huh. Manitoba is one of the only provincial jurisdictions to, not, to have not agreed with the stance that all Canadians' home heating bills should be exempt from carbon tax. Provincial leadership in other jurisdictions have already committed to removing the federal carbon tax from home heating bills. We petition the Legislative Assembly of Manitoba as follows to urge the provincial government to remove the federal carbon tax on home heating bills for all Manitobans to provide them much needed relief. This petition has been signed by many, many, many Manitobans. Further petitions? Grievances? Orders of the day, government business? 
The Honourable Government House Leader. Miigwech, Honourable Speaker. Can you please call the continuation of second reading debate of Bill 30, the Unexplained Wealth Act, Criminal Property Forfeiture Act and Corporations Act Amendment, followed by second reading of Bill 29, the Body Armour and Fortified Vehicle Control Amendment Act, followed by the second reading of Bill 33, the Change of Name Amendment Act, bracket three, followed by second reading of Bill 31, the Captured Carbon Storage Act. It has been announced that we will resume debate on second reading debate of Bill 30, the Unexplained Wealth Act, Criminal Property Forfeiture Act, and Corporations Act amended, followed by second reading of Bill 29, the Body Armor and Fortified Vehicle Control Amendment Act, followed by second reading of Bill 33, the Change of Name Amendment Act 3, followed by second reading of Bill 31, the Captured Carbon Storage Act. We will now resume debate on Bill Number 30, the Unexplained Wealth Act, Criminal Property for Forfeiture Act and Corporations Act amended with the debate standing in the name of the Honourable Member for Borderland who has 29 minutes remaining. The Honourable Member for Borderland. Thank you, uh, thank you very much, Honourable Speaker. And uh, it's uh, unfortunate that, but it is the way it works, that uh, sometimes debate gets interrupted and, uh, and so... Uh, <laughs> So one, the you know, one has to begin uh, again and, and pick up uh, pick up those uh, various strains of thought and try to tie them together again on the uh, the second uh, day of debate, which is where we are today, on uh, Bill 30, the uh, Unexplained Wealth Act, the Criminal Property Forfeiture Act, and Corporations Act amended. And I've appreciated the debate on this act and. Uh, uh, learned a lot and uh, and uh, also uh, have uh, some contributions to make uh, today as well. Uh, but I, in particular, appreciated the the uh, questioning, the line of questioning, and the comments of the uh, the member for Steinbach, uh, who is someone that I uh, uh, admire and uh, respect uh, greatly, and and whose wealth of experience I think uh, uh, elevates uh, this chamber. And, and, and who I think would uh, appreciate the opportunity to get back into the debate if he could, but uh, has spoken and, and I think has put some very useful things and, and very important insights uh, on the record and I think uh, provoked uh, uh, some thoughts that I think worth, are worth uh, fleshing out uh, further. And so um, I hope to get into that uh, a little bit more in my, uh, in my uh, remarks today. And uh, just by way of, of understanding the Act, uh, the, uh, the Unexplained Wealth Act um, enables a court to, uh, to make an order that requires a person to provide information uh, about how they acquired property or an interest in property if it appears that their known sources of income and assets would not be sufficient to do so and if the person or a closely related person have been involved in unlawful activity. If a person fails to provide the information required under an unexplained wealth order or provides false or misleading information, the property that is the subject of the order is presumed to be proceeds of unlawful activity unless the contrary is proven. And uh, so in terms of presumptions, the court is to presume, unless the contrary is proven, that cash is proceeds of unlawful activity if it is mailed or shipped with no information or false information about the sender. Or a building is, and a building is an instrument of unlawful activity if a controlled substance is found in the building in a quantity or in circumstances consistent with the trafficking of the substance. I find that interesting. I'll read that again. Yeah. A building is an instrument of unlawful activity 
If a controlled substance is found in the building in a quantity or in circumstances consistent with the trafficking of the substance. Now, this is a serious debate, but I just have to wonder as a sideline whether the White House would be considered a building that is an instrument of unlawful activity after cocaine was found there last year, but I, I won't get into that. But um, no, it's, it's but I do, think, uh, I do think, yeah, yeah it, it may be worth talking yeah. about in, a, in another jurisdiction. Um, certainly we don't, uh, we have, we have I, I hope, uh, higher, and I believe, higher expectations uh, of our politicians here. But um, as I said, this is a serious debate, and, and this, this unexplained uh, Wealth Act a great uh, uh, is a piece of legislation that deserves debate and, and uh, deserves to be scrutinized by this House. Um, my friend and colleague, the member for Steinbach, uh, yesterday, um, in his line of questioning, um, asked the Minister of Justice, what does this bill do that, uh, that is new or different from, from, what, from the existing legislation uh, that is already in place in Manitoba. And uh, I, I didn't feel that the Minister of Justice properly answered that question. Um, and I think uh, it, it, it remains an open question. That's not to say that this piece of legislation uh, shouldn't be passed. That's not to say that this piece of legislation um, sends us backward in any way. It's just a, it's just a question uh, that uh, that that should be perhaps explored a little bit further. And my friend and colleague, the member for Steinbach, reminded members of this house. Now, not all of us are um, uh, were here uh, prior to October third, uh, twenty twenty three. Right. There are many new members, uh, both on this side of the house and on that side. And I think. Uh, I have to say I appreciate the, the tenor of the House and the, the lively debate and the different perspectives and, and the contributions from, uh, from the uh, uh, diverse array of members. Uh, it's, uh, it's good to be part of a House where you have a lot of fresh new uh, incoming members. But for those of us who were elected uh, prior to 2023, and not that I've been here for any length of time, but I was elected in 2019, and we did vote on amendments in 2021. You're we voted on enough. amendments. Really? Colleagues say I'm not old enough. I'm, I am, I'm, not, I'm not yet 30, but I will be turning 30 this month. But I was here. I, I, was, I was here. I was here in, in 2021, along with several other members, uh, uh, both on this side and across uh, the way. And we voted on a series of amendments um, in this legislature to allow for unexplained wealth orders. And those amendments spoke about the process under under explained wealth orders uh, in the uh, in the 2021 20, amendments. And um, and so again, so the the already in Manitoba under the Criminal Property Forfeiture Act, there is the ability. As the member for Steinbach pointed out, that ability already exists uh, for, for law enforcement, for a court to make an order that requires a person to provide information about how they acquired property or an interest in a property if it appears that their known sources of income and assets would not be sufficient uh, to do so and if the person or closely related persons have been involved and unlawful activity. And so uh, those mechanisms uh, are already in place. Uh, the member for Steinbach, I found it interesting, pointed out that the amendments that were passed in 2021 allow the, allow the criminal property forfeiture director and the mechanism within that area of government to explore an individual's finances to see if there is an explanation for their wealth, and that's significant power. That is very, very significant power, and underlines why the debates in this House are so significant, because the impact of government on our liberties and on the freedoms of the, of the, of the, uh, the people that we represent 
is uh, it, it often goes uh, understated, I believe, yeah. and and is, is the ramifications of what we do here are are felt far and wide within the the boundaries of this province, but they have a major impact on the lives of of the of, of Manitobans, of all Manitobans, and yeah. so that is why debates like this are so important, and why it's important that every member be given the opportunity to fully scrutinize uh, legislation, to ask questions uh, of government, and in this case, questions of the Minister of Justice, and to, uh, to speak to uh, legislation such as we are uh, debating that is before the House at this very hour. And so, uh, again, back to my point, that in 2021, these amendments brought forward by the Minister of Justice at that time uh, granted government uh, through the criminal property forfeiture, uh, through government to the criminal property forfeiture director, uh, gave, uh, uh, created the mechanism to allow for uh, government to explore an individual's finances to see if uh, there is an explanation for their wealth and uh, again, uh, so that, that is something that uh, has been in place since 2021. So that, um, that line of questioning by the um, member for Steinbeck, uh, I thought was interesting, and it is a point that was borne out um, in his remarks as well. And I also appreciated listening to the, to the, uh, the insights of the member for uh, Portage La Prairie, who I've Thank you. Uh, really enjoyed uh, um, working with, and uh, I guess we're not allowed to comment on the absence or presence of a member, so I won't do that. But um, it is always good uh, to to be able to chat with him uh, in the house and Thank you. and to uh, to have conversations about legislation like this, and to uh, and I think it 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 it, it helps us. Uh, in our debate and in our insights and our perspectives as legislators to make sure that the legislation that is before this House and that eventually does become law uh, is crafted in such a way that uh, it does the job that uh, it is intended to do um, while at the same time uh, being minimally invasive in terms of its impact in, uh, in the lives idea. of Manitobans. Yeah, and so I think that that's uh, that's very important. But the member for Portage La Prairie brought forward some important points, and and uh, and one of them was one of the one of the statements he he made was make sure crime doesn't pay, and I think that is a mantra, a theme that everyone in our caucus subscribes to, here, and here, here, here. and while I think we generally are supportive of this legislation. I don't know that, it is, that, that this is a mantra that we necessarily, uh, uh, we may hear it from the government opposite, but uh, we, we are disappointed uh, at, the, at the inaction thus far, almost seven months in, uh, into government, at the inactions thus far, and in fact, even a little bit of uh, regression, mm -hmm. if we can say on, on the part of the government in terms of defunding some of the important initiatives within the Justice Department here, here. that are critical to uh, combating crime. And um, we are at a place where uh, in our province and, and across the country where crime is increasingly a very uh, real problem. And uh, it's manifesting in new and various ways. And uh, there's various causes uh, for the crime, uh, you know, organized crime has always been a, uh, a reality to a greater or a lesser extent. And then there's the crime of, uh, of um, opportunity, I think was the phrase, I might not be getting that right, but, but those folks who, uh, who uh, take advantage of an opportunity that suddenly becomes available to them to commit crimes. And it's been a concern, even in, in southern Manitoba, to uh, to hear and to uh, to uh, read reports of some of these crimes and and some of the some of the scams, frankly, that are happening, and that apparently people are enriching themselves by, and uh, it's it's 
an area of concern for myself and for my constituents, and I think something that, uh, that uh, the Minister of Justice must as well be aware of or should be aware of and within his department and that law enforcement is grappling with is, is the vast array of, of new and creative, ingenious ways that, uh, that these, these criminals have of trying to, to, uh, to scam people out of their, their, their hard-earned savings. One of them is um, the, uh, the electronic scams. And with, the, with the onset of uh, uh, technology and, and uh, the internet has been with us for some, some time now, but with all of the, the apps and the, so much is done, online banking and, and e-transfer, uh, is, is one of those things that's done through our, our uh, online banking apps that we, mo many of us have on our cell phones, um, is, is, uh, and is, is something that we use uh, perhaps on a daily or weekly or a monthly basis, many of us do, and, and that is one uh, area that has been in the news recently, um, as there have been folks that have cr found a creative way of, of uh, scamming people out of their money by sending them false links to uh, saying that they've, through, via email, saying that they've uh, been uh, uh, um, sent an e-transfer with money that they need to claim and log into their bank account to claim. And, and by clicking on that link and logging in with their uh, password and their confidential information, their username, the hackers or the, uh, the criminals are then able to steal that information and uh, use that information to gain access to uh, to the poor, to the hapless, uh, unsuspecting individual's bank account, the victim's bank account, and uh, thereby uh, enrich themselves through those ill-gotten gains. And, and that's, you know, a, a, uh, something that's very concerning. Um, and, and these folks, as I say, they're getting more creative all the time, and it's, it's becoming more and more difficult to catch these things uh, as often we're busy and, and, and perhaps in a moment of, of, uh, of uh, uh, where we're not suspecting anything and we, we happen to miss a couple details and uh, we have, you know, we, 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 we find ourselves a uh, victim of the scam. And so the Bill 30, the Unexplained Wealth Act, uh, helps to, uh, um, uh, to, uh, Clamp down on on uh, folks that are enriching themselves through uh, through uh, scams like this, and um, and allows government to go after them, and that's all fine and well. It's always important to ensure that our law enforcement have the tools that they need to go after the bad guys, and um, and and that's all very important. I think something that the public would broadly support. Um, one of the concerns that I have uh, about this is, is not that there is any abuse on the part of government, um, on the part of the courts, um, in terms of uh, the great power that this bill uh, gives them to, to, to force an individual, to compel an individual to explain their, their unexplained wealth or their assets. Um, it, it, it hasn't, uh, I trust, uh, happened to date, to, to, to date. The member for Steinbach pointed out, and I uh, thought it was useful to know, and I think all individuals would, would, uh, would appreciate knowing that um, from a civil liberty perspective that when an order is given under the Criminal Property Forfeiture Act that the vast majority of them, the vast majority of these orders, uh, up to 70% are over. In the estimation of the member for Steinbach, who was for a time a, the Minister of Justice, uh, so in, in, in his words, uh, his estimation, up to 70% or over are never contested by the individual. Um, so it's just important from a civil liberties perspective that uh, if the government is going to, you know, the presumption of innocence is, is the bedrock of our. Um, uh, is, is a part of the bedrock of our democracy, of our free society. And uh, every, you, you're, you're innocent, this is the concept that, the idea that you, you are innocent until proven guilty. 
And um, in fact, this is an idea that goes back to, um, to Magna Carta, perhaps even further back, but uh, I believe began to germinate uh, around the time of uh, the Magna Carta or the Great Charter that was signed by King John and uh, his uh, recalcitrant, if I can say that, or, or uh, uh, the, the nobility uh, who, uh, in 1215. And uh, by the way, that, that absolutely profound document back in 1215 um, forms a part of our heritage as Canadians. It's a part of that common law heritage that rich heritage of freedom, of, uh, of the freedom and rights of the individual, of democracy, um, and of the rule of law, that, that rich heritage that we lay claim to as Canadians, mm -hmm. and uh, through that British tradition and uh, of parliamentary democracy and, and that the... Uh, and so I think that that's something to be proud of and something that uh, that we ought to be reminded of uh, from time to time because it is the job of government to secure, to always be securing the rights of the individual. It's not up to government to give individuals or take, take, take rights or give rights. We don't get our rights from government, but it is important we get our rights from God. But, we, but it is the job of government to ensure that, um, that the rights and freedoms of individuals are all protected and that we are all uh, treated equally under the law. That is absolutely paramount in our society. And so um, from a perspective of civil, civil liberties, uh, it is important that when the government is transferring the onus uh, from, from the government, which is where it should reside and, mm -hmm. and normally does, but in this case, the government is transferring that onus onto the individual who is being asked to explain their gain, their, their unexplained wealth uh, or assets, uh, it is very important um, that we be very diligent uh, in making sure and that, uh, that there are, that as I said earlier, that this law is, is minimally invasive and that we're not, um, we're not creating a burden uh, on those or that we're not going after innocent Manitobans. Um, we don't want that. We want to go after the bad guys. And so, uh, as the member for Steinbach did say, though, in yesterday's debate, that um, it, it appears uh, to date that the individuals within the Justice Department and those that prosecute this act, this legislation, um, are very diligent, and so that is good. But I would still underline the potential for abuse that should circumstances change and a government perhaps have political motivations for going after an individual, uh, that becomes very problematic. And so, again, uh, I do not want to understate the potential for abuse, but I do, uh, I do think generally as, as long as government is diligent, and again, the concern is that we're, we're yielding considerable uh, power to the government to do this, but as, as long as government is diligent and going after just the bad guys, well, that's all fine and well. Uh, but but this power becomes a, a very a, a very problematic when um, when innocent Manitobans who have done nothing wrong and perhaps don't have the receipts and can't ex explain their wealth or 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 don't want to simply because uh, what right does government have to compel them to say anything uh, and and perhaps they are innocent uh, or, or or when they are innocent um, you know that creates a, a, a very tricky situation where their rights are then uh, uh, being trampled on. And we don't want that. So again, I just, I think as long as the focus is on going after the bad guys, that is exactly what we want to see. And I think that is, that is where the public, that is where the public is at. Um, we, read, we read about the, uh, the drug uh, industry, and, and it really is, an, it, it, it really is an industry, uh, the drug lords, um, you know, uh, Controlling the, the, so much money. absolutely, the control of vast amounts of money um, taking advantage and the of money laundering and the taking advantage of, of children and seniors. And my, my, my friend and colleague, the member for Portage of Prairie, spoke at length about uh, how, how uh, abhorrent it is that 
some of these individuals are particular are are, are explicitly um, exploiting the vulnerable. Um, you know, and, and isn't that the way it always is? You know, with with criminals. I mean, the, they're they're all they're these heartless uh, people yeah. going after. The, the the most innocent and the most vulnerable and and uh, and, and those being our grandparents and our uh, our children and so um, uh, of course uh, that's very problematic and so anything we can do to combat money laundering uh, the drug trade and uh, things like sports betting and and uh, any any kind of uh, illicit activity that people enrich themselves by uh, that is that is important. Um, it's important that we do that. And uh, so, but just while we're on this topic, I do want to say um, I always appreciated, um, and you know, and I hope it continues. I, I understand there's been a change in government, and and uh, that's all fine and well. But I always appreciated uh, being able to take in years past, having been elected in the fall of 2019. To, um, to take the Minister of Justice. It happened a couple of times when there were organizations in my constituency uh, in Borderland and the constituency that I represent, that I have the great honor of representing, uh, would, uh, organizations within my constituency uh, would be recipients uh, of funding through the Criminal Property Forfeiture Fund. And so uh, I, I recall one year, uh, Cliff Cullen was then the Minister of Justice, and he came down to Altona, and um, yep. and he, it was uh, Youth for Christ uh, Altona that received a twenty-five thousand dollar grant towards a van wow. that they used to then uh, pick up young children, uh, teens, youth, and uh, and and help them uh, in their lives, all the benefits, all the things that they do. And I know Sheridan Sawatsky and Marty Falk there at, at YFC Altona do just incredible work engaging with young folks giving them things to do and helping them in their interests. And, the, and so that funding was so well placed. And, um, and, I, uh, and so I, I had the great honor of being there with Cliff Collin and helping to advocate for that money. And I think that that's very important money that, uh, you know, it's money that's been, a, that was once used uh, by criminals to do bad things that has been, you know, that was seized by government and it, given to individuals that are helping uh, helping uh, to do good things in our community, to help our youth, you know, to help keep the, uh, give, the give the young folks in our communities uh, things to do and, and to keep them off the streets and out of a life of crime and, and show up. them a hand up, show yep. them a better way. Not a hand, you know, up, but a hand up. And we all need that. We all need that at different times in our life, folks to come on in our lives, you know, an individual to come along and give us, give us a hand up, give us help, give us a boost, you know. Yep. We're, yep. All, we're all human beings. And uh, we all we all struggle at various times, and uh, and that's so important to have that mentorship and those folks that come along and say, hey, you know what, what you know, uh, come along with me and let's let's go do something. Uh, let me show you something here. What are you interested in, and and uh, let's do it together. So and in a, in a productive uh, way that uh, that advances the interests of of our youth and, and young people. So that was uh, that was a real pleasure to be able to be there for that and. And to be a part of that process as well, and then I think of um, Oak Bluff Colony, and oh, a good let colony. me tell you, uh, Honorable Speaker, wonderful people. Um, wonderful. Jack Mandel, yep. Paul Mandel, um, Manuel uh, Mandel, yep. and uh, I'll tell them later on. Uh, perhaps show them this, but uh, uh, just want to say thanks to them. They uh, formed the uh, Hatterian uh, Aquatic um, Emergency Aquatic. Re uh, Heart. Recovery team. team. I'm, I'm going to get this. Yep. You got Heart it. You got is it. the you acronym. Got it. I'm struggling a little bit, and no, I and I apologize it. to the Mandels and to all those on the team. But it's Heart, and I and you folks do exceptional work and have for years, and and are wonderful people. And um, you know, Honorable Speaker, they came to me shortly after I was elected, if I recall, and and they had fundraised extensively for a sonar side scan. They actually work with the Winnipeg Police Service and the RCMP. And they were just, they, they had, I mean, they were scraping the bottom of the barrel trying to get, to, trying to buy this, this sonar sky, uh, side scan ROV, this camera that they could, um, that they could uh, uh, use uh, that would search, uh, scan the bottom of, of lakes and rivers, waterways to search for drowning victims, things like that, and do uh, recovery of, of bodies. 
Uh, and so uh, they needed about 50% more funding to, to actually acquire the device. And I was able to work with Cliff Cullen again at the time and get them $38,000 through the Criminal Property Forfeiture Fund. And uh, they've since gone on to add additional equipment and they're always fundraising, but they were so appreciative of that support and they have gone on to do many great things with that technology to bring closure to so many families. And so um, I can't speak highly enough of the benefits of this program and uh, I uh, trust that the Minister of Justice will continue uh, with that, uh, the good work uh, that is uh, done within this program. And I, uh, uh, seeing that my time has, uh, is about to expire, I thank uh, you, Honourable Speaker, for the opportunity to speak. And uh, thank you. The Honourable Member for Lava Andre. Honourable Speaker, for this opportunity to to speak on this bill, uh, um, a, a bill that supports law enforcement is an important bill not only for, for Manitoba but also Canada. Um, I, I'd like to have the opportunity, though, to to speak to to the effects that uh, that crime has on all of Manitoba, and it it affects every household unfortunately and it affects every community and it has a trickle-down effect to our social services and the economy. Um, so I represent a corner of, of Manitoba, the southeast corner, Lavra Andre constituency. I grew up my entire life in this constituency in the same community. I'm proud, proud of the community, proud of the people of the community. Um, yep. Multi-generational uh, community you, where people stay and people come. Um, it's uh, a region, a region of the province that right now is one of the fastest growing. We have some of the fastest growing towns. We have the fastest growing municipalities. Um, so, so the community is one that. That people stay, and now we've we've attractively been uh, gaining new people to to the constituency. The problem that that I'm seeing as the representative uh, provincially for for that corner of the province is we never used to have what may have been considered the big city problems. We never had large. Uh, drug crime, we right. never had yeah. large property crime, we never had petty property crime. Um, things have drastically changed they're changing. And, uh, and, and they're changing everywhere. So yeah. whatever us as legislators yeah. are able to do to combat the effects that uh, crime has on everybody in the province is welcome. So we should we should never allow crime to creep further into our communities. Right. And, uh, and the issues with property crime that we're seeing in different jurisdictions across this entire country are very concerning. And we're seeing those very similar in, in our province, throughout our province, in, in the larger centres, Winnipeg, our larger cities, and also our smaller rural communities very similar to the rest of Canada. Um, Toronto has been making the forefront of news coverage in recent months, showcasing the effects that uh, vehicle crime has um, in many of those communities and, and the network that is associated with uh, organized crime. Um, the problem is that the, the networks of crime are changing from the traditional large-scale organized crime yep. led by um, large gangs, limited numbers of, of large gangs or organized groups of crime. And, uh, and that's changing to, to more of an unorganized uh, ground-level um, crime where we see that not only being in theft but also in um, in drug distribution. So, so it was many years ago as, uh, as the drug crisis of, of our country and the rest of North America for that um, 
was, was run by one or two large scale rings of, of organized crime and, uh, and it was significantly easier in, in some aspects to, uh, to come up with legislation like this, uh, the forfeiture of, uh, of proceeds of crime, yep. um, to discourage uh, that type of activity. So at that time, um, several years ago, um, this type of legislation, an amendment to legislation like this, um, to increase the ability of law enforcement to uh, fulfill their, their jobs and duties, um, would have been more welcomed and, and more valued because you'd be able to identify the, uh, the organizers of, of that crime and, uh, and through an act like this, through legislation like this, you'd be able to punish them by, by taking the proceeds of the activities that has, have done harm on, um, on others throughout the community the province or, or the country. Um, now what we're seeing is a rampant crisis of, uh, of ground level crime, whether that be distribution of the drugs. Yeah. We've got, uh, we've got an issue of, of drugs, uh, the, the methamphetamines. Yep. Random acts um, of violence. Yeah. Um, Big pharma. So, so th these are the drugs that are that are ruining people's lives, and the effects are far-reaching. So, uh, what what I've been seeing in my community is uh, is constituents of mine, which are also my neighbors, which are also my friends. Um, these are people that run businesses um, in the community. These are people that that just reside within the community, or these are people that have recreational properties within the communities, yeah. and they are all affected by by the issue of petty rural property crimes that that we're seeing now. And I, I've got many questions uh, around this bill and what it's able to do for that. So, so I'm part of uh, so group chats, community group chats. Uh, multiple community group chats that I've been included in because um, myself as as not only the MLA the the provincial representative um, I own businesses and I, I farm within my communities so I've got my ear to the ground and I'm affected by this rural crime as much as anybody else um, may be throughout all of Manitoba um, so in, uh, in fulfilling their duties um, as law enforcement and passing on punishment to, to those that deserve it. So right now, um, throughout all of rural Manitoba, and uh, the coincidental part is since I've been getting more and more involved with the, uh, the situation within my community, word has gotten out that uh, that I'm a, a provincial representative, and I've been getting calls from constituencies throughout all of Winnipeg, and we've exchanged. An MLA. We've exchanged. We're an effective we've exchanged, MLA. We've exchanged stories, yeah. and uh, and all of the stories. <laughs> all of the stories are very similar, and and I'm proud, and uh, and and I I I offer my my services as an effective voice for all Manitobans. Right, so, right. so whether, whether that be my constituency or a constituency that feels that they aren't effectively represented by, by their elected official, I, uh, I have no issue with extending, uh, extending my, my helping hand. The kind of public service um, so so uh, these stories are, are very similar. Are these, these are these are petty property crimes that truly affect people and affect their safety. So these are people that have been targeted numerous times, have had their cars stolen, have had their sheds broken into, have had people break into their house, and, and they see that these aren't people driving Ferraris that the cops are following. Um, the, these are people that are, that are 
riding up on a bicycle, breaking into a shed while somebody's at home watching out their window, and they're calling law enforcement, but unfortunately, law enforcement uh, you know, is, is subjected to uh, the limitations of, of our legal system right now. Yeah. So, so they, uh, they may arrest the people, but many times it's, it's not worth arresting those people. And they just, it's the revolving door that these people continue to function within our communities. And, uh, you know, before someone's able to fix the lock on their shed, um, the, the offender is, is back again, um, you know, threatening their safety and definitely uh, threatening the, the, the protection of, of their home and, and their personal property. So, um, so the, these are issues that are widespread across the province. And um, like I've said, I, I welcome legislation that's able to give uh, more tools in law enforcement's toolbox to combat the, uh, the, the crime issue that, uh, that we have in Manitoba. So I, I've got one example that, uh, you know, is, is true to me. This only was two months ago now that, um, that I was coming from the legislature to, uh, on a Thursday evening, going back to my constituency and, uh, and, and stopped for a meeting um, along the way close to my constituency office and continued on to, uh, to the curling rink in, in my hometown of Vida. Oh, right. And the al along the way, I, uh, I noticed a, a car, a, a car of a friend that's driving uh, suspiciously. Radical. So Radical. I, 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 phone, I phone my friend and uh, sure enough, that vehicle was stolen. Oh. Wow. And, uh, and, and I see it, so, you know, start to follow the vehicle. Step on it. And, and this was a real, a real eye opener to the limitations, unfortunately, that, uh, that the dedicated men and wo women have in law enforcement across our province and specifically in in the RCMP so so I, I followed to make sure that I didn't lose sight of this vehicle in the time that the RCMP were able to respond and these these are examples of the type of crime that is really affecting my community so so the, this this wasn't um, an organized drug lord that uh, was driving a Ferrari and I picked up the phone and I told uh, told the local RCMP that I think I see the local drug dealer driving a new Ferrari. It's got to be $100,000 plus. And if you nab them, you'll really, really be able to put a damper on uh, his operation. No, this was a stolen car followed by another stolen car, followed by people that are re-offenders in, wow. in petty cro property crime. And... Uh, so, like I say, it was an eye-opener, so I, I continued to follow the vehicle this while I'm waiting for the RCMP, which the RCMP had told me on the phone that, um, you know, there's no point pursuing. Um, unfortunately, um, you know, they would talk to me when I'm there, but there's nothing really to do about it. Um, but I figured... I'd at That's least crazy. make sure that I knew where my friend's car was going because yeah, I'm sure they would appreciate to have their car back or with, with know where the, know where the car is. So uh, this is a so basket. so I continued to to follow the car while waiting for the RCMP to respond. And us in rural Manitoba, so so just uh, That's why you're here. Just yeah. to make everyone aware, this community that I speak of is is over an hour from the closest RCMP detachment. So, you know, you, you can appreciate that law enforcement uh, is very limited on response time. But uh, while I was doing this, you know, they, they, they felt that they were being pressured. And uh, so I had somebody get out of the vehicle, the, the person that had stole my friend's car, and they came towards me with a gun. Um, so serious? I had a gun brought forward to me, and uh, and yeah, that uh, you know really makes you uh, makes makes you think about uh, 
the decisions that you have now in a small town where oh, where in years past you would uh, you, you wouldn't feel scared whatsoever approaching anybody in that particular community and now Ooh. we've got people coming at each other with with guns so yeah it was a sawed off shotgun that the person came at me with um, so uh, so you know the this ramps up your uh, your adrenaline definitely and uh, makes you think why would you need to be in this type of a situation I don't deserve to be in this type of situation driving to uh, a, a curling game on a, on a Thursday uh, evening but uh, th this is where crime and uh, and the petty drug trafficking has gotten us in, uh, in not only this province, but it's across the country, that and it's something that we definitely Seriously. need to give uh, give more authority and more control to the RCMP. Because yeah, yeah. I had the RCMP meet up with me after I, I was on my on on my phone on Bluetooth, of course, and uh, and called everybody in the community. Um, so I I thought, well, this is great. The RCMP, they're able to pick up the bad guys and put them in jail and uh, and and uh, you know we're we're going to have resolution to this situation my friend's going to get their car back sure hope um, this uh, you know outside of feeling threatened um, i i thought that uh, you know we we had accomplished something um, later to find out just how limited in these situations our law enforcement actually is. And that's why I support giving the law enforcement any ability, any additional abilities to fulfill their position. Right. Because when the RCMP got there, they, uh, they had said that, you know, there's, there's a get the people. That's crazy. Um, it doesn't warrant uh, them getting the property back. Um, and, and they were hand-tied in getting the property back. And, and I could see the frustration in the officers' eyes and their reactions um, that they were genuine. Uh, the, these are genuine concerns that they have in fulfilling their, their roles um, for, for law enforcement. And uh, further to that, I said, well, you know, we, we pursue pursue the uh, the vehicle that uh, that was stolen and you know we'll we'll make sure that we keep an eye on on you know these these places and and call the RCMP to come and uh, and be able to to catch these people later on and and I further found out that the RCMP um, is against their policy to pursue vehicles to pursue stolen vehicles. So um, we've got tremendous work that needs to be done, and this is a multi-jurisdictional um, issue. This is something federal. It's a federal jurisdiction, um, and uh, we really, really need to uh, to work harder at at changing that legislation at the federal level to give RCMP. Um, law enforcement, because that's who we covered with in Manitoba, outside of outside of the cities and uh, and a few other, a couple municipalities and towns that have their own police force. But outside of that, you're dependent on the RCMP and and their ability. So um, so these are the people. These are the people that I had this situation with, and the community continues to have that situation with. These are the types of criminals that have realized the, uh, the limitations of the system and uh, are exploiting those limitations in the system. These are the same people that I've had residents of the city of Winnipeg call me and say, we know who the people are. We, we know that um, they're a low level criminal um, committing petty property crime, but it's threatening the safety of myself, it's threatening the safety of my family, it's threatening the safety of the neighbors, and uh, we know who it is, but we're not able to act on it. So when I look at legislation brought forward like uh, Bill 30 today, um, I, I have questions on 
whether or not it's going to do anything. Um, like I say, I'm, I'm in favor of giving law enforcement any additional capability to fulfill their job because I, I couldn't imagine being in the shoes of those officers that came to meet with me that night after I would like to think of myself as a respectable uh, community member, um, had a gun pulled on them uh, blatantly in my face um, from only a few feet away um, and threatened my life with, uh, with a weapon. Um, and, and, and having that done to me and, uh, you know, the, the look at that, in that officer's face, not having the ability to act on those actions that were put forward to me, um, I feel for, for the position of, uh, of these men and women in law enforcement. So, so when, I, when I heard commitments through the campaign um, by, by this now government and, uh, and our now premier, um, this, this NDP government, I, um, I didn't take it too serious. Um, you know, the, the NDP haven't notoriously been uh, well known for being tough on crime. So, uh, so I didn't give it much consideration, but now that, uh, that they have formed government um, and are leading this province, I, I expect this government to, uh, to take action on making whatever legislative changes that they can to, uh, to protect us as Manitobans. It shouldn't be that in rural, remote communities like the one that I live in, and have always lived in, um, it, it shouldn't be that people coming from other communities and areas of this province um, are going into these communities as a safe haven because they know that they're not able to be touched right. in the larger centers, yeah, we don't want but them. they do have the pressure um, within those larger centers and they realize that in the smaller communities they don't have that pressure. Again, like I say, our closest our closest detachment <clears throat> for the RCMP is more than an hour away from us. So we're, we're sort of at, at the mercy of the people that are at the makeup of our communities. And, uh, and yeah, it, it shouldn't be myself. It shouldn't be my family. I've, I have a wife at home with two young little boys. Um, she runs a store in our local community. Um, she runs a store that has all sorts of people come through the door every day. It, it shouldn't need to be that my wife in our community, made up of good people, um, needs to feel unsafe. So getting back, to, uh, getting back to the bill, because surprisingly time is expiring, um, we, we look at, uh, at commitments that, that have been made by, by this government. So, so we see that the NDP government during the campaign had campaigned on an unexplained wealth act and indicated that they would be following what has been done in BC. So at, at face value, I thought, uh, you know, th this is something that, uh, that maybe is unique to BC. And just because I felt that, that possibly this government was out of touch of the, the, the root of the true crime that we're seeing in our communities and uh, not believing that uh, large, large organized crime is what is threatening and uh, downright just annoying and discomfort um, residents of our province. Um, I knew we needed to do more um, to combat that crime and, uh, and I wasn't convinced that this is going to be the answer um, to a solution for, for the issues that, that I've experienced and that other Manitobans are experiencing every day. So as I have done more research on this bill, I realize that uh, did, did some reading 
And uh, so the BC government, so I'll go back and uh, so the campaign promised by this current government was, was they campaigned to uh, do more for an unexplained wealth act, to, to create an unexplained wealth act, and indicated that they would be following what BC had done. So then in my research, I read um, that in 2023, March of 2023, when BC announced their new law in March of 2023, the Attorney General was quoted saying there is a sim similar piece of legislation in place in Manitoba. Wow. So 2023 was last year right. and BC brought in this great legislation and they brought in the great legislation modeling the legislation that we have in Manitoba and then at the end of 2023 our yeah. current premier said that he's going to create legislation that's just like BC's. So Which is just I, like I immediately got even more confused, and uh, I'd like to think that I can walk myself through these uh, these these situations of confusion. But uh, I had to read further because. Uh, we were going to copy BC because it's great, and BC the year before copied us because we were great. So where exactly do we end up? So I had to draw it out actually, and um, and and in the description, the uh, the physical description, we came back to Manitoba. So if Manitoba copies BC, which BC copied Manitoba, we end up at square one, we, which is that we have um, legislation around uh, proceeds of crime forfeiture, and, uh, and this, was, this was expanded on under the previous PC government. So the former PC government took steps to combat money laundering and was among the leaders in the country taking action against organized crime. So I guess this premier and this NDP government was copying the great work that our previous attorney general had, uh, had done. So uh, unfortunately, we're, we're ending up with debating today legislation which we already have. And yeah. so in 2021, the PC government passed legislation uh, making changes that strengthen the ability for the criminal property forfeiture unit to quickly act on securing money that investigators believed to be illegally acquired and could be subjected to money laundering. In 2022, the PCs expanded staffing capacity within the criminal property forfeiture unit, the CPF to combat money laundering. They hired two investigators and a financial analysis um, to target organized crime. So, so this is already happening, um, which brings up new concern of mine. Um, like I say, I, I, I support any additional capabilities that we give to law enforcement because I see the effects and the limitations that we have on law enforcement. Um, but I, I'm really concerned what the intent of this legislation being brought forward right now, because when I read through the bill, um, no one sources of income and assets would not, that aren't sufficient um, for the person or person that is closely related to that person is assumed to be unlawful activity. Then, forfeitures do not rely on criminal prosecution. They do not create findings of guilt or innocence and are technically initiatives against the property, not the person. It is a civil court process. So this starts to really concern me and, uh, and alarms start going off when We've, we've got this legislation in place in Manitoba already. It's been copied by BC, who we want to copy. Yeah, right. um, so so they, they've copied what we have, now we want to copy what they have. It doesn't line up. So when I dig deeper and I want to know what is hidden here, or potentially hidden, right. it doesn't really seem to have any clause 
on combating the crime that we have. This is something that you need to prove your innocence and not the other way around. Yeah. And it, it doesn't lock up anybody. So basically, any additional amendments that are made to this legislation, the only thing that they do is make it easier for the government uh, through the extension of law enforcement yeah. to, to, for forfeiture of, of personal property right. that someone isn't able to explain. So with this government being at the helm, I have certain level of concern. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Good job. Great job. The honorable member for Selkirk. Thank you very much, honorable deputy speaker. I have an opportunity today to stand up and, and speak on Bill 30, the Unexplained Wealth Act, and how it relates to me. I, re I represent the people of Selkirk, but most importantly, I represent my family and my values in this chamber. And you do a great job. Right? Yes. And, and as I as I look to my my role and how I perceive myself, I like to think I'm on the side of right. When we know right from wrong, and although in this house, in this house we all represent our values as well and we we may disagree on certain aspects of our values i'm certain we all agree on what is right and what is wrong to have criminals amongst us prospering and generating wealth from crime that comes from the backs of hard-working people and hardworking families in our communities is despicable. The, these are members of our communities that have worked very hard for what they've had, who've done the right things, who've went to work each day. They taught the lessons to their families, to their children, supported their neighbors, and been on call for the community to step in and do what's right. And other members of the community decide what you have is fair game. They're able to steal that, they're able to steal your money, steal your identity, steal your possessions, steal your livelihood, and with no regards for how that will affect that person. People are forced to lose tens of thousands of dollars, and tremendously more if they're not insured. And people are given the opportunity to continue this. So when we have an opportunity to make sure that crime does not pay, I am for that. I am for the fact that we want to strengthen our police departments and take the, the opportunities away from the criminals and to ensure that every person in our province is protected and the funds that they earn on an honest living stay in their pockets. And people have the right to go out and purchase things. So when I take a look at Bill 30, the Unexplained Wealth Act, Criminal Property Forfeiture Act and Corporations Act amended, I have a number of questions to make sure that we are protecting the people we want to protect and that government doesn't have too much of an overreach. Right. We need to make sure that legitimate situations where people have earned property, that they don't have to explain that in detail when they haven't been accused of a crime. But we also want to make sure that the people who are committing crimes do not get away with it, and the proceeds of those crimes are taken away from them and brought back to the people or to the society that needs them. Now I look at a few things on face value. One of them was if somebody sends money and it's not addressed properly, 
and you can't confirm what it is for that is perceived a property of crime. And as funny as it, my argument is about that, I have an aunt who's 85 years old, and for far back as I can remember, every year she will send $5 or $10 by mail. There's typically not a card. It's just a, your name on an envelope and a little bit of cash. And, and she's got, she does this at the beginning of the month, every single month. And it's a really a sweet thing. And she sends this money out. And you know, you, you get this envelope and you open it up, and it's from my dear aunt who lives out in St. Claude, Manitoba. So according to this, she's a criminal. She's sending money by mail. And as a recipient, all of us, nieces, nephews, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, are also receiving ill-gotten gains. And I'm certain this legislation is not going after my sweet aunt who's sending birthday money out to everybody. But we have to make sure that we are not doing things that will harm innocent people. Absolutely. You're right. You're right. You're right. We, we have... In my family business, I've had the opportunity to travel all across North America, putting up buildings. I have stayed in different communities. I've been in countless hotels. I've been in countless communities, talking to people, staying with the owners of the houses, staying on First Nations properties, and sometimes communities conduct business a little differently. When I was at the Deer Lake First Nation putting up a building that we sold for $30,000, as soon as I arrived on the community, the chief who had me stay in his house, through the duration of the installation of the building, immediately gave me and paid me $30,000 in cash. I immediately wrote out a receipt for the money and I put it on the table along with my bag of clothing and I was told by the, the chief son-in-law, do not leave that money there, lock it up in the room that we provided you in the house. I was, I was a little shocked that somebody would actually go into the chief's house and possibly take the money, but they are on the side of caution, that's what I'd done. Upon return into Selkirk by plane from Deer Lake, I would have been deemed a criminal. Getting off the plane with my bag of $30,000 in cash after arriving from a First Nation, somebody could have possibly put a connection that maybe that was ill-gotten gains. Maybe that I was on the, on the First Nation property for nefarious reasons. I can assure you today that we were there, we worked with the members of the community, we did a beautiful job, we received amazing hospitality where the chief's wife, who refers to herself as Kukum, cooked for us, told us stories of the community, and welcomed us in her house. We were very early risers while we were there and got a chance to meet some of the children as they're waiting for the bus. And we want to make sure that Bill 30 protects these people, protects our neighbors, whether they're on the First Nations or, or next door to us, protects our family. And it supports the values that I tell my children, that don't wait for someone to give you anything. You go out and earn it. Yep. And you earn it with respect. My children, at seven years of age, would come down to the shop with me as I would work. And they would ask if they can do anything to help out. So we'd give them small token jobs or they'd make a little bit of money. And they have a phenomenal work ethic. I hear from so many people how they, they cannot believe how my son 
and my daughter work so hard for people of their generation. But importantly in our business, we need to understand that when we have wealth, when we have property that can be claimed at any time, if you can't explain it, we have to make sure there's some real facts put on the record here that if you've earned property and you're not a criminal, that should be out of reach from anybody's touch. Here, here. But, honorable deputy speaker, for the criminals who think that Manitoba is open for their enterprise to take advantage of our citizens, we need to get stronger. We need to call war on them, to their organizations, to the recruitment of the young people here. If the people of the young generation would realize that crime doesn't pay, that when you go out and you sell drugs or steal from people, we're going to claw that back from you and we're going to take that away. We don't even have to go to trial and send you to jail. We will, if you cannot prove that, as, as, as a student in high school that you're driving uh, a fancy car and you've got a whole bunch of money, you better explain yourself. So we need to make sure that we're protecting the people of our province. As I mentioned, I've had the opportunity to travel a lot of places and some of the communities I've gone to have just been amazing. I had the opportunity a number of times to be up in Snow Lake, Manitoba. And that is a community built as a mining town. Most of the homes when I was there about a decade ago were unlocked. The people in that community watched out for each other and the crime was extremely low. That is a sense of where we should be today. As a child growing up in Tyndall Park, I remember only after we were broken into and somebody ransacked our house did we start locking the doors. People would think it would be foolish today to leave your house without locking the doors. That's because the criminals got away with it. When you take a look at the criminal enterprises, we have to take a look at what is happening with the money. Now, there's a lot of TV shows out there, Honorable Deputy Speaker, that, that show crime happening, whether it's, it's drug lords or anything else, and I just finished watching Breaking Bad. And one of the biggest problems that people have is how to launder that money. And it's very evident in the show that how this happens. Now, in trying to figure out this bill, and I know that when I take a look at my other colleagues on this side of the house, and, my, and I mean really brilliant colleagues, I had the, the opportunity to talk to the member from Steinbeck on this, and I said, I don't understand where this bill is coming from. I think we have this bill already. And he says, yes, yes, we do. Th this bill was created here in Manitoba. It was copied in BC, and we've copied BC's bill back here. And I can understand that as members of the legislator, legislative building here, we want to go out and we want to put laws into effect that protect all of our members in our community. And when I sit down and I take a look at some of the legislation I could bring forward, and I talk to the, the members on my side of the House, and I talk to them about what I want to bring forward, often I find out that already exists, and I just wasn't aware of it. So I'm not going to fault anybody for trying to bring forward a bill that's going to, they think will help Manitobans. I would just... I, I would just hope that somebody would have done the homework or asked somebody else, hey, I'm thinking of going ahead with this. Can you put some eyes on here, look at it with your knowledge and let me know? And hopefully we can 
move forward and maybe change some legislation that exists to make it better or create something brand new. But when I, when I sat down, I wanted to understand why we need this bill. What happens in our communities? What are these criminal enterprises looking at? And there's many different things that happen. They take a look at the ability to get wealth into the hands of the criminal and make it look like it's there legally. So we take a look at different things and there is a commission report that was done and we want to sit, I want to sit down and look at that report on a detailed basis and try to figure out how does this happen? Because I, I don't understand. I come from Selkirk, I trust my neighbors, I trust the people going on. And as I take a look around, Honorable Deputy Speaker, I looked at this and I found out corruption and bribery is one of the ways that stuff happens. So, so a criminal enterprise can, can persuade and, and, and force uh, through bri bribery uh, false documentation of making money seem whole, like transfer of funds into bank accounts and yeah. other ways. Now we've heard from other places that one of the common things for these criminals to do is to take a load of cash, go down to the casino, okay, spend a few hands, gather a bunch of chips and go cash it in as winnings. Well, that is clearly a, a blatant direction to make money whole. Honorable Deputy Speaker, we have a lot of things that go on on a daily basis that maybe we don't know about and how this affects what we do. But there's a counterfeiting and piracy of goods and services that criminal organizations will copy the work, the, the copyrighted, patented products of another organization and sell them. And they'll sell them on the internet, they'll sell them at trade shows, they sell them at fairs, and they sell them as if they're the authentic product. And they sell them for a fraction of, of the cost and they, they make millions of dollars but upon receiving those funds, they need to get this money back in to their cash flow, and they need to clean this up so they launder the money. So if we take a look at what, what's going on, we need to shut down on the, the products that are showing up in our great country that aren't manufactured under license or under trade for these companies. We need to protect these companies from losing their, their trade names, their products, their sales, their profitability to people who are doing the counterfeiting. One of the largest opportunities for criminal organizations is to be in the illicit drug trade. The, the amount of money generated in the illicit drug trade is an amount that we can't measure because we haven't caught all the criminals. If we had an ability to catch the criminals and collect those funds okay, and make sure that they weren't rewarded for going out and reselling drugs and harming our communities and creating a spiral downward effect in our mental health with homelessness and addictions, if we could stop the drug problem and stop making it lucrative for people to sell drugs, we wouldn't need this bill. But that is not the reality that we're in, Honorable Deputy Speaker. We know that the illicit drug trade is increasing, not just in our province, but it's in our country, it's in our community, it's on our streets. I personally know people who have died from drug overdose. My cousin has died of a drug overdose. The pain and harm that caused his family through his entire addiction and now in a subsequent death 
is a pain I could never understand because I don't go through it. But I certainly would have the empathy to feel for them. And if we have a bill like this go forward, we need to make sure that that money is being used for the right purposes, that we're using it for victim services, that we're giving it back to the police departments. I have a good friend who's a sergeant of police here in the city of Winnipeg. And he worked at one period in his career undercover. And the biggest downfall for continuing and actually catching the criminals was they weren't able to work overtime. And a crazy system they have between the unions and the negotiated days and the times, and I leave all that stuff up to them, but there wasn't enough funds in the budget for them to work overtime. When the criminal activity happens from midnight to four in the morning on average, they would find that they needed to be off work at midnight. So they would watch everybody as they're just coming out of their slumber at four o'clock in the afternoon, and they'd start going about their daily business, and midnight when things were getting hot and juicy, they were off shift, and the next shift started at eight o'clock in the morning. If we could take these funds and aggressively go after the criminals, the large enterprises who are blatantly harming our society, grabbing money and sticking it in the faces of hardworking people, if we could take those funds and use those funds against the very same people who are destroying our society, we would have a chance. We have mass marketing fraud. Just yesterday on my phone, the government texted me that my carbon tax refund is available. I just have to click this link. Yeah, oh, I, I couldn't wait. I couldn't wait to get those funds. I've been the victim several times of, of people. <laughs> of people taking my money. And, and traveling across North America, it happened so innocently. I go check in a hotel, the guy skims my card and says, sorry, that machine didn't work, I'll try this one. He's got all my card information. Within hours, that credit card is compromised. I was the victim of recently somebody getting a hold of my banking information. And, and through my personal accounts, my credit card accounts, my corporation accounts, they grabbed $85,000. Okay? That was a, about a year ago. It took me three months after that to generate all new accounts and secure everything I had. It didn't come out of my pocket because it wasn't my error. Unfortunately, we're seeing these type of cyber attacks happen all over the place. The University of Winnipeg was recently the target of a cyber attack. Now the University of Winnipeg is doing their part to try to stop any further damage happening to the students there. They're giving them two years of credit monitoring. But you know what? My daughter went to that school for several years, and as parents, we were proud to pay for her education. Our credit card information is compromised, and we have not received any two years of free credit checks. We were, our credit and payment system, our information is in their payment system, which was compromised. So we need to make sure that this is a deterrent, that we go after the people who are taking our funds. We go after the people and we use it to deter them from ever doing it again. That along with strengthening our judicial system to actually have some real teeth and not saying, not tell them, don't do it again, or we'll tell you, don't do it again, and then we'll tell you, don't do it again. 
We need something that stops people from heading down this path. It's a learned behavior. The people that I went to high school with, who were good, decent, hardworking people, now have good, decent, hardworking children. The scumbags that were in the schools that I went to, their offspring are now scumbags. The drug dealers created new drug dealers. I hope we can change that. I hope that as we work together to bring people out of poverty, and as a society, I find too many times we turn a blind eye, that when someone says, hey, I got a deal for you, I, I have got something you could buy, it's stolen, so I'll give you a really good deal, we say that's not acceptable. In our organization, our family business, we have worked very, very hard. And one winter, I wanted to take my family out for a vacation to Hawaii. I was very excited that the year before, I put up buildings in Hawaii at the Hickam Air Force Base. And I worked with the members of the POW MIA and gave them two buildings to bring back remains of fallen soldiers across the world where they can identify those fallen so soldiers through DNA. And I was so proud of that, I wanted to take my family out to Hawaii and take them for a tour, a guided tour, and show them where I had an opportunity to put up these buildings. We arrived on a, a Saturday morning, and Monday morning, I called back to work to see how things were going, and I found out that somebody had broken into my shop that night. And they stole a tremendous amount of equipment. They stole generators and post hole augers and ladders and tools and hand tools and power tools. And I, I couldn't believe it. And I'm, I'm a little naive. I just think that as a community, we should look out for each other. And then I hear people said, well, big deal. You're insured, you're gonna get new stuff. Big deal. And that's how the criminals look at it. Here's a company, they've only employed people for the last 25 years. They've they created a, a, about a, a bunch of wealth, but who cares? You've got insurance. Well, we reinvest in our company and we reinvest in our people. And when our deductible is $5,000, I care. And the people who work for me care because we didn't have the money to replace that equipment. So when we have an opportunity to, to capture those criminals who steal our livelihoods and make things more difficult for all the members in our community, we need to jump up and say as a community, yes, this makes sense. We need to take the money out of criminals, but we need to make sure that we're doing it the right way. Last week, when I started looking at this bill, I seen something there that said human trafficking. Just last week, I dropped off my colleague from Morden Winkler at the airport. And as we were going up the ramp, I could see a lady running, being chased by another individual. And as we passed, it didn't really register at first what was going on. But quickly, we looked at each other and said something wasn't right. Something wasn't right, and I needed to go investigate. She got out of the vehicle, and I did another loop around at the airport. When I pulled up, the lady was being forced down the ramp that vehicles drive down away from the airport. I pulled up. I asked her if she needed any help, if she was in distress. And she was forced to say that everything was OK. The person holding her Okay. whispered something to her, and then she said, I'm fine. I immediately called 911, got on the phone with an operator, and at this point needed to do another loop around, and I pulled into where you wait 
for people to give you a call at the airport before you pick them up. And as I waited there, I explained what was going on, what they looked like, what was happening. And I was certain in my heart of hearts, this lady was in trouble. And I couldn't help but feel that she was being trafficked. She's a victim of human trafficking. And we need to know that we need to stop these victimizations from happening. Our police need to have the resources available to them. We need to make sure that when we put legislation forward, it's for the betterment of everybody in our society and that we can go after these criminals and let everybody know, especially our youth, that crime doesn't pay and this is not a path they want to go forward on. We need to put that money back in the hands of our police department and ensure nothing nefarious happens any longer. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Fort White. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Honourable uh, Deputy Speaker. It's an honour to stand and rise in the House. And uh, for the first minute, I'm just going to ask for a little bit of leniency from the Deputy Speaker. I wasn't here yesterday. Uh, so I do just want to take 30 seconds and acknowledge that uh, yesterday was uh, Eid al Fitr. It was the celebration of the end of the month of Ramadan. So I was absent from the House. Uh, to the pleasure of the members in here. Oh, sorry, I can't say that. Apologize, Deputy Speaker. Um, yesterday was the day of Eid al Fitr, and it was a great celebration for the community. Uh, for myself and, and my son and, and friends and family going on eating. And, you know, I do want to thank the members in the House uh, for their patience uh, with me speaking uh, for the last month, uh, being very, very dehydrated, uh, taking pauses regularly. And now I, I will say that I am blessed uh, to have a glass of water where if I do get tired, I can take a sip. And it is really uh, the month is, uh, of Ramadan is really to, sh to, to be grateful for everything we have. And it is a blessing to be uh, here in this building today, it's a blessing to live in Manitoba in Canada. It's a blessing to have a drink of water afforded to us whenever we are thirsty. So uh, with that, uh, I thank all the members for putting up with me over this last month. And uh, Eid Mubarak to everyone uh, and the member opposite of the way, uh, way as well, the member for Sinaboya as well. Uh, Eid Mubarak and Eid Mubarak to everyone uh, on that. So thank you, Honorable yeah, Deputy Speaker. Yeah, yeah. Oh man, it feels good to drink some water and get right into this, right? So, uh, Honorable Deputy Speaker, as we speak about, um, you know, it, it is a blessing. It is uh, um, a privilege to live in a country like Canada and a province like Canada and to live in a society that has rules uh, and, and legislatures that put forward laws to protect us and make us better as a society. It is a blessing to have that. It is a blessing that we shouldn't take for granted when we get to stand up and talk about bills uh, and debate laws that are going forward. Uh, and I will try to say some um, original thought that my colleagues have not, uh, you know, one after one another, really articulated uh, the points on this Bill 30 that is brought forward. So I'll try to go a little bit uh, of a different way. But before we get to that, uh, I think it's really important to acknowledge uh, the great work of, of everyone in this House, and I want to thank the Minister of Justice for bringing this forward, uh, but it, 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 if I'm going to thank the Minister of Justice, the credit really goes to the previous Minister of Justice. I want to thank the member for Steinbach for the decades of work that he's put into this building, for his blood, sweat, and tears in the legislation that has passed to the effort and sacrifice that he has done years over years and years to put good pieces of legislation forward. Now, last week I stood in the House and I said, you know, the greatest form uh, of flattery, this is a quote, uh, and I'm going to butcher it here because I'm not in front of you, but one of the greatest forms of flattery uh, is um, imitation. Imitation. And uh, imitation is the greatest form of flattery. And it doesn't come as any surprise that this current Minister of Justice is copying the previous Minister of Justice. That is clear as day. And that is a really good, you know, a testament to the great work uh, the member from uh, uh, Steinbach uh, has, has done over the decades and decades and decades uh, of working in this building. So the Minister of Justice really is just thanking him for the work. 
Um, and, and the way he's doing that is when you look at these bills, you say, well, why are you saying that? I can hear, you know, uh, members opposite are heckling and chirping. They go, well, why are you saying that? And that's crazy talk. And I say, okay, well, l let's take a second and actually look at the bill, because I don't know if the members opposite have actually read the bill. Um, and not only that, the historical importance of what happens in this building, Honorable Deputy Speaker, the member from Steinbach, the member from Springfield Rashad, uh, the member from uh, Swan uh, Lake, the, the Swan River, Swan River, Swan River, sorry, Lake River, apologize. Uh, even members opposite, actually, sorry. There's been members here that, that have been here for uh, years as well, and they have the historical institutional knowledge that a lot of us new members don't have. And that cannot be discounted when it comes to talking about laws that are brought forward. Now, when it comes to the Minister of Justice, the former Minister of Justice, I say, well, he's just copying him. He's copying the great work he's done. And I'm going to make a case for how that is when you look at the, le the legislation brought forward. In Bill 30 that is proposed, in the explanatory note, um, it says, changes to the Criminal Property Forfeiture Act include the following. Unexplained wealth orders. The court may make an order that requires a person to provide information about how they acquired property or in an interest in property if it appears that their known sources of income or assets would not be sufficient to do so, and if the person or a closely related person have been involved in any law unlawful activity. Okay? So that makes a little bit of sense when you look at the bill title, uh, Unexplained Wealth Act, Bill 30. You would say, okay, so uh, what, what, are you, what are you getting at? And I said, okay, well, let's go back and look at the bill. And again, I, I won't go over the history of this, all the members have spoke about this, that in 2021, a piece of legislation was brought forward that covers exactly what Bill 30 is talking about. It almost word per word is what Bill 30 is talking about. And it's unfortunate because I know the members opposite are new. I know they've had a couple stumbles when it comes to the legislative process this year, uh, when it comes to deadlines, when it comes to dates, when it comes to getting bills forward for first readings. Uh, I also understand that they're forcing bills through. The same thing was apparent in the gas tax stunt that they pulled, that they had to amend it, and other amended bills. This is another one. So I read Bill 30, <coughs> now it looks like a bill, <coughs> 50, it was called Bill 58. Uh, and this was done uh, in the third session of the uh, 42nd legislature, and uh, I'll read here. This bill amends the Criminal Property Forfeiture Act. The key changes are as follows. Now, members opposite might want to take a listen to this because they, they'll understand that it's literally almost the exact same thing. Um, currently, forfeiture proceedings must begin before a person can be required for answer questions about property believed to be an instrument or proceeds of unlawful activity much more concise way of saying exactly what uh, this Minister of Justice has copied in Bill 30. Paragraph 141. Don't see the difference? Acquired property requires a person to provide information about how they acquired property or interest in property. Required to answer questions about property believed to be instrumental or proceedings of an unlawful activity. I, I really don't see uh, you know, why this NDP government is bringing forward legislation that we have to spend days and days debating when it's the exact same thing that was brought forward in Bill 58. When you go further into that, um, you know, this bill, you read on Bill 30, if a person fails to provide the information required under unexplained wealth order or provides false or misleading information, the property that is subject of the order is presumed to be proceeds of unlawful activity unless the contrary is proven. And I'll get into the presumptions. Let's take a look here. This bill allows the court to make two new orders before forfeiture proceedings begin. Preliminary uh, preservation order, which prevents a person from disposing of property if the court is satisfied that there is a serious issue to be tried in forfeiture proceeding. Oh, so actually this bill that they meant actually leaves that out. So I would say Bill 58 is a better bill. It doesn't, this is, uh, Bill 30 is a lot of adage, a lot of verbiage to say what has been said in two sentences in the previous bill. A preliminary disclosure order which requires a person to answer questions about their acquisition of property believed to be an instrument or proceeds of unlawful activity. Exactly what their explanatory note says. The only difference is, honorable speaker, is they're about three and a half years late. So, why would they bring this forward? 
I mean, you have to ask yourself, and I'll get to that a little bit later, why would they bring it forward? Why are they bringing the exact same legislation forward? The only thing you think of is they are not ready to be in government. They are scrambling for ideas. As my colleague, uh, the member from uh, Borderland, eloquently said, the member from Steinbach has said, the member from Brandon West has spoken about this, the member from Lavarande, uh, Lavarandre, uh, the member from Selkirk. They all spoke at length of how this was uh, done in this province in 2023. That Bill 58 came forward and was put into implementation. It had ascended and it was law in this province and it was benefiting Manitobans. Now, don't take my word for it. Don't remember the members opposite uh, would do that. So how do we know it is? Because BC, as the member from uh, Borderlands had said, publicly stated in 2023, that's last year, that they're going to copy who, Honorable Speaker? Manitoba. They're going to look at what Manitoba has done in legislation in Bill 58 that was done in 2021 by the member from Steinbach. The BC provincial government came out and said that, and they copied what was done here. They took it to BC, they've implemented it there. So this new NDP government comes and says, oh my God, we gotta do something, what do we do? Let's look at what BC is doing. And we can see they wanna copy BC and they wanna to try to be like the BC government maybe. Uh, I don't know why they would want to do that. They have their own problems. But they said, let's get this legislation through. They, they, they brought this forward in 2023. Let's get it done in 2024. Not realizing that this was already done here. When you look at the presumptions, in their bill it references the court is to presume unless the contrary is proven that cash is uh, cash is proceeds of unlawful activity if it is mailed or shipped with no information or false information about the sender. So we can look at this. The bill adds new presumptions concerning cash vehicles and other property. The court is presumed unless the contrary is proven that cash found in close proximity to a controlled to a controlled substance or bundled in a matter that is not consistent with standard banking practices is proceeds of an unlawful activity. Basically the same way, Honorable Speaker, of covering off the same idea, the same concept, the same spirit of the law. And that is what we here are talking about. Why are we moving forward with the exact same piece of legislation that's already done? It's already there. Why? Does this government, does this NDP government not have original ideas of their own? It's evident we've seen that uh, with this latest budget. Yep. With this latest budget and the tax breaks they are doing in the budget and the cuts, which I'm going to get to uh, in this budget, which really go opposite in how they say they want to combat crime in this province. They want to bring it down, and yet they've had sweeping cuts across that department. It is seen in the budget that they have no original ideas because their best announcement by their own uh, uh, will, by their own admission, by their own advertising in the province is the previous government's tax savings for Manitoban families. The previous government's work, which had nothing to do with them other than the fact that they voted against it. They voted against those changes, now they want to take credit for the changes. We can go on and on ad nausea the bill here, but I think that covers basically the explanatory note. Uh, there's two more pages here. Uh, I, I won't get into all those details, but I think it's pretty clear that when you look at Bill 58 uh, that was done in 2021, and you look at Bill 30 that's proposed by his Minister of Justice, it's really just a form of flattery to the member from Steinbach, to the member from Springfield Rashad, who have been here for decades working on legislation in this building to the members who have experience and wisdom and who have gone around the carousel a few times, who understand how legislation works. This minister is simply copying what was done before. There are no changes. And further to that, Honorable Speaker, um, you say, okay, well, just, you know, explanatory note isn't enough. Let's get into some details. Well, why don't you give the minister an opportunity to explain himself? Because those sound like very reasonable questions. Uh, those sound like very reasonable questions. Uh, so let's give the minister an opportunity to explain those. I think that's logical. There's a question period that happens before debate goes up. And uh, lo and behold, Honorable Speaker, you know what happened? We asked the Minister of Justice those questions. We asked them over and over and over again, and not one answer. 
Not one answer, and that is running par for course when you look at this NDP government. They refuse to answer any questions. No accountability, no answers. Whether it's the Minister of Health, Minister of Finance with increasing taxes to the tune of $148 million, Minister of Justice on this. Minister of Justice goes on, and, and uh, I'll read from Hansard here, that under Bill 30, proposed amendments to the uh, Corporations Act would require Manitoba's corporations to disclose their beneficial ownership to law enforcement, to regulatory bodies, to the Director of Criminal Property Forfeiture. If passed, these amendments will help law enforcement across our province to investigate serious criminals and will specifically impact drug traffickers and money launderers. All very important things that were done by the previous government. All of those were laid out in Bill 58. So when it comes to Bill 30, there is no new substance. There is nothing new in this bill. And to be clear, I think one thing we do agree on, and we might argue, ah, it's different, it's not. We would all agree that fighting crime in this province is important. It is, uh, you know, along with, uh, you know, many other issues in this province, uh, fighting crime, fighting organized crime, drug dealers, traffickers, money launderers, is all of utmost importance. That is a nonpartisan issue that I think we can all get on board with. And there are numerous subjects that come up in this house where we could all get on board on the same page. This one you think we would as well. And we are. Bill 58. Bill 58 that was done before goes on to do exactly what this minister claims that he wants to do. If he wants to do it, then he should just remove his bill and put more resources into enforcing Bill 58. Now, when you want to enforce a bill, um, you would have added costs to that bill. And a simple question to the minister was, what are going to be the added costs of this uh, from the MLA from Portage of the Prairie asked? Very reasonable question. Will there be additional staff needed in the criminal property forfeiture branch for this? And if so, what are the costs? Minister's response? Well, as I said, Honorable Speaker, we're supporting the work of the staff in the departments. I don't know what that is. That is an embarrassment if that's an answer for a minister. Now, that was one of the first questions, so minister might have stumbled. Let's give him another opportunity. Um, and, and it goes on to ask more and more questions. And the minister, uh, uh, sorry, the MLA for Steinbach uh, asked the question, would the minister like to explain why this is different than those things that have already appeared before the courts? Minister of Justice. Again, and, and I encourage everyone at home who has any questions to look at Hansard from yesterday. Uh, look at Hansard reference April 10th, 2024, page 1160. Uh, it starts a little bit before that, but you get to the question period. Previous Minister uh, of Justice, the one who brought the bill forward, asks, would, you, would this minister like to explain why this is different than those that have already appeared before the courts? And the minister says, but reality is, that if they think that things where the status quo was okay and the crime's going up, then that was just fine. Maybe you should go back and look at the results of the last election. I, I, I don't know why this Minister of Justice lowers himself to cheap shots when the Minister simply asks the question, why is it different? So he'll go again, member from Steinbach. I'm not trying to embarrass the new Minister. I know this is a big file. I know there's a lot to digest. Criminal Property uh, Forfeiture Act, there's a lot to explain. Um, he needs to explain what the difference is than the powers currently existed by Bill 58. M Minister responds, so now I know they're trying to get some sort of the, you know, sweep out the old spring cleaning right now. They're trying to sweep out the old carpet and clean up the caucus over there. It's time for some new blood. We expect some real questions in this legislation as we can, can get past today if the member of the former minister would just like let us get to work. I mean, not only is that not proper English or grammar, um, it is an embarrassment to the question. And the minister uh, of justice should be appalled by his answers when legislatures on this side of the house are simply asking him to say, what is the difference between Bill 58 and Bill 30? Now, that's two questions, three questions, four questions. I won't read them all because I think members opposite get the point. They refuse to answer any questions on legislation they want to bring forward, which tells us they don't understand the legislation. Well, maybe they just don't want to answer those questions. Maybe they actually do have an understanding, and that's a big maybe, Honorable Speaker, uh, because I will ask you another round of questions. 
The member know that, um, the, is from the member from Steinbach, says the member uh, will know that the Cullen Commission in British Columbia brought forward a number of recommendations as it comes to criminal property forfeiture. Can you explain how the recommendations from the Cullen Commission fit into this particular piece of legislation? Because if you're going to bring uh, legislation forward, you want to understand the history of it, the impacts of it, especially in the province that came out and publicly stated they're going to copy what Manitoba is doing. The minister's answer, wow, a blast from the past here in the chamber today. It's interesting the former member, I guess current member, former member, now decides he wants to get up and put some words on the record. You know, it's surprising during the campaign, all we heard was, we don't need this, why are we doing this? And I guess maybe sheepishly, the former minister may be admitted <coughs> privately saying, yes, we didn't get this done. While this government is getting done, we're, talking, we're taking the good work of the Cullen Commission, we're taking the people of Manitoba's direction, and we're getting to work on unexplained wealth orders. Complete non-answer. The simple answer, if the minister actually understood, you'd say, thank you for the question opposite. The uh, Cullen Commission was in regards to A, B, C, and D. He doesn't know. If you ask me what 5 plus 5 is, Honorable Speaker, I'll tell you it's 10. You ask me a question, I know the answer to, I answer it. If I don't know it, I would make up a long-winded answer saying, well, you know, if you want to ask me that question, we need to look at the roots of where uh, um, uh, math and calculus actually came from. And if you go back to the time uh, 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 of the, of the Middle East and, and the Egyptians is where they made math and uh, oh, time's up. Okay, great answer. Five plus five is 10. Why won't the minister tell us what's different about this bill? He doesn't know. Why won't the minister tell us what the Cullen Commission is? He doesn't know. How will this make a difference in Manitoba? He doesn't know. How can you ask legislatures in this building to pass legislation when he has no idea what he's talking about? It's flat out embarrassing. Now, you want to say, okay, well, give him another chance. He might have stumbled at the Cullen Commission call. He has to look through his notes and find that red folder. So, Minister Steinbeck, we go, uh, MLA from Steinbeck comes back and says, from what I gather, the member doesn't know what the Cullen Commission is. I'm asking him if he can just maybe put aside the partisanship. Part, partisanship. I can drink now, fasting's over. Put aside the partisanship, if that's possible, and just explain how this particular bill fits with the recommendations from the Cullen Commission. And again, another very reasonable question, I think we can all agree, and the minister's answer um, is a non-answer. I won't get into reading because only, I only have eight minutes left. Uh, I feel like I, I uh, could go on and on forever, um, but it's clear in reading Hansard, this member has no idea what he is talking about. This minister is simply regurgitating legislation that was done before under the previous PC government, just like they've done time and time again, and take credit for it. Whether it's the PCH homes, where they were announced before, and then they cancel and they bring back to life. Well, why did you cancel them in the first place? Whether it was the uh, Portage Place announcement, oh, we're gonna cancel it, oh, we're gonna bring it back to life. Um, or whether it's um, anything else really under this uh, sad excuse for a government right here. And I know members will be upset when I said that, but really when you look at the legislation that they brought forward, some of it really needs to be questioned as to what they're doing on that side of the House. Honorable Speaker, again, to be very clear, we all agree we have to fight crime. We all have to fight um, organized crime, money laundering. These are things that put our society at a risk. We need to put in resources to handle that. How do you put in resources when you are making cuts? I'm gonna quote here um, the member from Waverly. So Brandon Police Services, uh, but sorry, I'll, I'll skip ahead, don't no need to get into that. I'm gonna the whack laugh, but they also highlight a stark contrast to the approach previously taken by members opposite uh, and their long uh, freeze of municipal funding. And yet, when you talk about funding, let's look at this recent budget by this NDP government. And I want to thank the member for Waverly for bringing that forward. It's a long list of cuts this government has made. It's a long list of cuts. Uh, it might take the whole seven minutes to read them off here. So let's look at all the cuts they've done in their budget here, Honorable Speaker. I'll grab everyone and says, what have they cut? Community corrections, cut. Court operations, cut. Share of services, cut. Family resolution services, cut. Victim services, cut. Provincial policing, cut. Policing services, cut. Public safety, cut. Law enforcement review agency, cut. 
Manitoba Police Commission, cut. Independent Investigation Unit, cut. You think I'd be done now, but the list goes on, Honorable Speaker. Crime Prevention Branch, cut. Security Intelligence Branch, cut. Manitoba uh, Criminal Intelligence Services, cut. And what's the real kicker? Criminal Property Forfeiture Unit, cut funded. How can you bring forward a bill for the love of God saying you want to enforce it when you are cutting their funding? When asked how you're going to pay from the member from Portage La Prairie, how are you going to pay for your resources? Are you going to increase staffing? Are you going to increase the budget? The Minister of Justice gave a non-answer. It is embarrassing that they give non-answers. I read this answer because I wasn't here. Uh, yes, uh, I, I read this answer uh, as I like to take in all the information, you know, reading it and then also watching it. And when you read it, it is embarrassing at the lack of knowledge and information that this minister puts on the record. The uh, member for uh, Fort Gary is far better equipped to answer these questions, uh, and yet he is resigned to the third row for some strange reason that blows our mind. The M Minister of Justice did not answer one question, and yet sweeping cuts across the board for justice, and they talk about how they want to uh, support the criminal property forfeiture unit, and they have sweeping cuts. It is uh, one of those uh, conundrums, Honorable Speaker, that I will never understand to this day, how you can say you want to support something and yet cut the funding from a dozen uh, branches, a dozen units within that uh, unit or, uh, itself, within that department. Members on this side of the House have talked about the civil liberties and what this means to civil liberties, what this means versus a criminal uh, offense versus the, the civil liberties, and that is something that needs to be addressed that this minister, this minister of Justice did not answer, that this Minister of Justice has no answers for, that he's not properly prepared for, to understand what the uh, far-reaching implications of this act are, and yet he wants to force legislation through. These are things for Manitobans need to be concerned about. It is a simple matter of this government not being ready to govern, a government in waiting that's been waiting and waiting and waiting and still is waiting to do something to make a difference in Manitoba. When you look at why they had done this, you'd say, okay, well, they ran on a campaign to say, uh, bail reform, we're gonna do it, even though, again, just shows you, Honorable Speaker, that this Minister of Justice has no idea what he's talking about. We're going to uh, come up with a bail reform system. We're going to change bail. We're going to come down on the criminals. How? In 100 days, he said. To tell what I've said, 100 days. How many days has it been since the election, Honorable Speaker? 190 days. What have they done? Nothing. What have they done to make the Manitoba streets safer? Nothing. What have they done for bail reform? Nothing. These are concerns Manitobans have. They will say something and have no plan for it. We have not seen a plan on anything on that side of the house. Oh, sorry, $300 cameras for, for businesses. $300 cameras to combat crime. How about instead of putting a $300 camera in, you keep the criminal away? How about you put your resources into catching the criminal and making sure they don't get out? How about you put your resources into actually doing something that makes a difference instead of signal virtuing like this side wants to do? instead of uh, pandering to what they may think is a, a, a base, a, a vote that they think they can scare up and get on board with their side and saying, we're going to combat, uh, we're going to change bail reform in 100 days, in 190 days, they have done nothing. Nope. It is simple smoke and mirrors, as members on this side of the House have said, and Manitobans are seeing this now with this government. It is smoke and mirrors. Whether it comes uh, to the Minister for Municipalities or the Minister of Sports, Culture and Heritage and Tourism, uh, smoke and mirrors with their announcements. Say one thing to the municipality and then change it the next day. Wow. Say you love parks and then vote out a, uh, a resolution or a bill brought forward uh, to support parks, get more money into parks. Whether it's to combat crime and actually not do anything about it. There's a reoccurring pattern here where these members simply want to signal virtue. They want to pretend like they're doing something. In reality, they have done nothing. Our member on this side of the House pointed out another great example today. Um, <coughs> our critic for health, that they have no plan for health. Over 1,300 procedures have been canceled by this government as of uh, January 1st. Nothing. No plan. 
No plan on how they're going to implement Bill 30 here, the criminal property forfeiture. Um, now, this may just be a bill where they want to do no harm, and they just want to bring forward a piece of legislation to look like they're doing something. Exactly what they've done the last three months, when in reality, they have done nothing. They have done nothing. It's embarrassing that I have to stand up here for half an hour and talk about how this bill is nothing, and how this, and members on that side of the House won't even stand up to talk about this because they know it's nothing. They know they have nothing to stand on here other than we're going to combat crime. Great. We all want to combat crime. What are you going to do? Uh, we're going to copy you guys. It's, it's really unfortunate. It's concerning. Manitobans need to be concerned about what's happening here. Uh, I want to thank uh, all the members on this side of the House that have spoken so eloquently about why this legislation is a form of flattery for the member from Steinbach, why it's merely just copying what was already done, it was already in place. How about this government get to work and implement good legislation that's already in place, that other provinces are uh, copying, that other provinces have enacted, that we have enacted here in this province. It'd be nice for them to actually do something, to actually make a difference for the people of Manitoba instead of just pretending like they're doing something, instead of acting like they want to make Manitoba a better place, when in reality, they really don't. Honorable Speaker, thank you for allowing me the time to uh, stand and speak, and I hope Manitoba's clear picture, smoke and mirrors of the NDP on this side of the house, we'll actually get some stuff done for you. The Honorable Member for Agassi. The Honourable Member for Agassi. Agassi. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. I am proud to stand in this House as the representative for Agassi constituency. Hey, hey, Agassi! Hey, Agassi! Hey, Agassi! And also the opportunity to speak to Bill 30, the Unexplained Wealth Act, uh, Criminal Property Forfeiture Act, um, introduced by the Minister of Justice here recently. The unexplained wealth orders are currently being used in over 100 different jurisdictions. This bill allows law enforcement, criminal property forfeitures <coughs> office, and regulatory enforcement agencies stronger tools to build cases against assets used in organized crime, drug, tra drug trafficking, and money laundering. The Unexplained Wealth Act is the issue of individuals acquiring assets or wealth that cannot be reasonably explained by their own sources of income. It provides authorities with the necessary tools to investigate and seize assets that are suspected to be the result of illegal activities such as money laundering, corruption and organized crime, like I mentioned. Having key people, a dedicated unit within law enforcement agencies to investigate such cases of unexplained wealth is imperative to capturing and holding criminals accountable. This would give the proper authority opportunity to gather evidence, trace financial transactions, and collaborate with international counterparts to identify and seize assets that are connected to criminal activities. Again, it's very important that we look at this legislation and its aim to combat illicit financial activities and uh, organized crime by targeting unexplained wealth and uh, combating financial crime ensures that our province is not a safe haven for those who seek to hide their ill-gotten gains. It serves as a deterrent for individuals involved in illegal activities and helps to protect the integrity of our financial system and the protection of all of us Manitobans. Furthermore, the Act enhances the ability of law enforcement agencies to recover the proceeds of crime and redirect them towards programs and initiatives that benefit our communities. This can include investments in education, health care, infrastructure, social services, ultimately improving the quality of life for all Manitobans. In Manitoba, it's important to note that money seized under this Forfeiture Act is subject to court order and controlled by the Director of Criminal Property Forfeiture. Under the former PC government, funds from forfeiture programs were, from the for program were distributed to a variety of initiatives throughout the province. Organizations like Bear Clan Patrols, Combating Cybercrime, reducing catalytic converter theft, providing internet in northern areas for court appearances. I would also like to acknowledge the great work of those that volunteer and contribute to Bear Clan, 
This organization does a lot of fantastic work on the front lines and providing conflict resolution and in some cases prevents further criminal activity. The PC government, when in power, took great steps to combat money laundering and was among the leaders in the country who took an initiative and action on this front. It was British Columbia that looked at what Manitoba had done and then adopted a similar model in their province. It's clear we can all agree no matter what side of the house we are on, crime and the property and monetary assets here, here. obtained from crime should be and needs to be addressed. Community safety is of key importance in all our communities right across our province. It's a growing concern for many Manitobans and leaves many feeling vulnerable and unsafe right in their own homes. I know in my rural riding and surrounding areas, many have been subject to break-ins and theft. Unfortunately, rural crime is not new and it's existed forever, just like the other, same in other jurisdictions and communities in Manitoba. Not one specific place um, has not had this challenge. It does, however, seem to be growing in boldness and time of day. Along with growing number of thefts, there's just as many or drug seizures and increased trafficking in our province. There has been drug and weapon seizures in my own rural community. Last year, the RCMP responded to a report of a stolen vehicle in a parking lot on Main Street in Nipua. Officers arrested three adults and one youth. They also found a second vehicle linked to the suspects in the same parking lot. And during the search of the vehicles and the suspects, the RCMP seized four firearms, 64 grams of crystal meth, a small amount of cocaine, bear spray, weapons, and other stolen property. They all faced multiple drug and, re and weapon related charges. Um, another situation in rural Manitoba, just this last February, where our CMP conducted a traffic stop on Highway 16 in the rural municipality bordering Agassiz. In that stop, the RCMP noticed a Ziploc bag containing a quantity of dried cannabis. What? The occupants were placed under arrest and were requested to exit the vehicle. And officers, as officers were securing the suspects, one of the males fled the scene on foot, heading towards a community. Um, our, our RCMP officers from the surrounding area were contacted and they responded to the situation. The suspect was arrested without in incident and the search of the vehicle and the suspects led to seizure of uh, uh, drugs, um, cocaine, and um, a cutting agent as well. Officers also seized weapons and the bear spray and other paraphernalia. One of these individuals was found to have outstanding warrants. Um, you know, a number of years ago, I myself was a victim of crime. I was shopping at a mall um, in the city, and I had my young daughter with me at the time, and parked in front of the mall, uh, right in front of the door, or close to the door, so I, um, right in broad daylight. I was went in for just a short moment, well, for 20 minutes, it was a short shopping trip. <laughs> It was a, a quick in and out, and when we left, I exited the front of the mall to find out that my vehicle was not there. And I'll tell you, it's an overwhelming feeling when you have your young child with you and your vehicle has been stolen in broad daylight, leaving you um, without transportation. I had to go into the store and make several calls to uh, seek rescue and, uh, and report the uh, stolen or the theft. The vehicle did turn up weeks later and in a ravine with contents stolen and some minor damages. And uh, I do want to commend the great work the RCMP officers and the related supports on the ground do in providing safety and uh, keeping drugs off the streets, weapons out of the hands of criminals, and working to keep our communities and our province safe from the acts of these criminals. Um, also, thank you to the officers, Brand, you know, the city police, Brandon and Winnipeg, who work on the streets to make them a safer place. Living in rural Manitoba, our nights may be quieter and are safe from the sirens most nights. And we may, may not bear witness to some other antics and obvious criminal behaviours that may be more, more prevalent in larger urban centres on a day-to-day -day basis. I have to say, last night and, and uh, other nights, I hear first responders, fire trucks, police cars, etc., sirens going through throughout the night, but last night especially seemed an endless night of sirens. 
Now, granted, it could have been me, but there seemed to be a significant uh, more of them. Clearly, emergency situations were happening, and you can hope that all turn out well for those involved and pray for those that seek further help and rescue. Having said that, I have to say thank you to those who respond every night continually to those emergency calls. They go out in the middle of the night, perhaps several times a night, to disturbances and often dangerous situations and at times risking their own lives to protect us here in Manitoba. Crime does exist, and it does exist everywhere. There is no boundaries to this existence and no easy solution to combat this. And many get involved Order, in please. Criminal. When this matter is again before the House, the Honourable Member will have 21 minutes remaining, the hour being 5 o'clock. The House is now adjourned and stands adjourned until 1.30 on Monday.